Okay. Right, good morning. Let's uh, go ahead and call the meeting to order. So everybody that's sitting down, if you could, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Happy New Year to everybody. Welcome to 2022. Uh, it's the uh, regularly scheduled planning commission, January 13th, um, first one of the year. So, um, Let's go ahead and uh, Ms. Light, are, are there any changes to the agenda? Yes, good morning. Good morning. Um, correct order of item, item number two, PDC 2105 CG for Hammer Crossing um, has been moved to presentation schedule and will be heard here after item number three, Mangrove Cove. Advertised public hearing presentation schedule, item number two, PDC 2105 CG for Hammond Crossing uh, has a revised schedule of permitted and prohibited uses at voluntary profit by the applicant a public, and a public comment. And item number three, PDR 2103 CG Mangrove Cove um, have a revised staff report and the revisions are highlighted and all these changes are included in the agenda system very good and uh, for um, confirmation item number one is still presentation upon request item number one is presentation upon request very item good. number two is the item that going to be presentation scheduled very good thank you very much all right um, are there any changes or information from the county attorney's office none at this time chairman thank you very much all right, we're going to go on to um, citizen comments. And citizen comments are the opportunity to speak on items that are, that are not on today's agenda. If you have a comment or question related to something that's on the agenda, you'll have an opportunity when that item is heard. But you also have an <coughs> opportunity for things not yet uh, on the agenda. So is there anybody who has anything they'd wish to put on the record related to items not on the, on the agenda? Okay, seeing no one come forward, we're going to go ahead and um, move to um, presentations upon request. So, Ms. Lidar, can you please read item number, um, item number one into the record? Item number one, C2108, Forever Up Homes, LLC, Forever Up Homes owner. This is a quasi-judicial case. It's a rezone of more or less 0 0.84 acre for residential single family 4.5 RSS 4.5 to residential duplex district 6 RDD6. The area is subject, um, the area subject to rezone is more or less 0 0.30 miles north of Cortez Road at the corner of 38 Avenue West and 26th Street West, and is commonly known as 3803 26th Street West Bradenton. The case manager is Kevin Oldman, and he's a quasi-judicial. Very good. Thank you. Uh, for the record, have there been any ex parte communications regarding this application? No, yes, sir. Okay. Um, and also for the record, please uh, note that Mr. Rutledge is not yet joined by Zoom. He'll be joining <coughs> around 10 o'clock, so... Oh, he is. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. Can you please confirm that he's participating and not just logged on? Mr. Rutledge, could you please speak? So. Yes, ma'am. I am monitoring it. However, I am going to uh, step away for a few minutes, so I will not be participating in this particular presentation. Okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Rutledge, could you please let us know when you when you join? Uh, which, um for uh, I process, yeah, to, to participate. Yes, sir, I will. Thank you. Thank you. So, again, uh, Mr. Rutledge is not, uh, he's not physically present, nor is he uh, mentally present for this one. Spiritually <laughs> present. Sure. <laughs> so, all right. Um, that may be true all the time, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> no argument. Um, 
So uh, if we could, can we just get a brief introduction of the application? Uh, who, who do we have that might be, maybe can summarize what we're looking at here? Mr. Chairman? Yes, ma'am. Where everybody in? We probably should. You know, it's the first meeting of the year, so. Um, if everybody who has any intention to speak on any application today would please rise to be sworn in. Thank you. Do you swear or affirm that the factual statements and representations you are about to make to the Planning Commission are truthful and accurate? Thank you. When you step to the podium, please state your name and if you've been sworn. And you'll have three minutes. Thank you. All right. Good morning, Mr. Oatman. Have to adjust the mic for my height. <laughs> Good morning, board, um, honorable chair. My name is Kevin Oatman. I'm with Building and Development Services. Um, the project here, Forever Up Homes, is pretty much a rezone of uh, 0.38 acres <coughs> uh, to RDD6, which is the residential duplex district. Um, it is located off of 26th Street, uh, just a little bit north of Cortez Road, as Ms. Leiter had mentioned before. Uh, basically, what he's wanting to do is, in the future, he's wanting to actually um, possibly do more of a residential dwelling for duplex, and the surrounding developments to the east is also RDD6. So therefore, he's wanting to kind of be consistent with the um, residents and the neighbors beside him. Uh, the area is, excuse me, surrounded by um, residential dwellings as well as some neighborhood commercial type office buildings. So that's pretty much what we've um, got today for you um, in terms of the rezone that they're wanting to do. Very good, thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Oatman, would you say that the request is consistent with both the comprehensive plan and the land development code? Y yes, sir, it is. It has. Very good, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, also, um, the, the site complied with all the dimensional criteria and regulation for the LDC related to RDD6. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, any questions for the applicant? No. Okay, very good. Uh, we're going to go ahead and open this application up for public comment. Is there anybody in the audience who wishes to come forward and speak on this application? Anyone at all? Okay, seeing no one come forward, we're going to close the public comment. Any, any additional information necessary from the board? I mean, from the applicant for the board? Okay, thank you. All right, we're going to go ahead and close the public comment portion of the hearing. And the chair will open it up to discussion, deliberation, or consider a motion. Mr. Chair. Mr. DeLesline. I move to recommend adoption of Bandy County Zoning Ordinance Z2108. Very good. We have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. I have a second uh, by Mr. Ron. Uh, we'll call the matter to vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, like sign. Chair votes aye. Motion passes 6-0. <coughs> Thank you. All right. We're going to move on to... Item number two, Fort Hammer Crossing. Miss no, Light. Item number three. Two oh, comes I'm, after three. Oh, well, I'm sorry. It's new math. Yeah, it's I didn't com know yep. Common Core math now. Well, one moment, please. Uh, I have a conflict of interest on Mangrove Cove, um, so I'm going to have to step away from the uh, the dais and turn it over to Mr. Ron. So. Sir. And at this point, uh, has Mr. Um, Rutledge come back at all? No? Okay. All right. Very good. Just wanted to come from that. You ready? Ms. Slider, can you read it? You ready? Item number three, BDR 2303 CG Mangrove Cove, Lennox Enterprise, Edward Cole, Successor Trustee, James McCauley Wallace, Jr., Intervivo Trust, Crown Holding Group is the contract purchase. It's BLN 21030043 and it's a quasi judicial case. A rezone of 57.55 acres located 0 0.19 miles west of Palmasola Boulevard on the north side of Cortez Road and having the address of 4322 Street West and 99,000 Cortez Road West, Manatee County. And it's from MCM and RSF 4.5 and overlay A-1, coastal planning area, coastal evacuation area, to the PDR. 
and is approving a general development plan for 148 multifamily residential dwelling units with an amenity center. The case manager is Marshall Robinson that is absent today and I'm gonna be answer any questions or do a brief presentation and the, pla and the um, agent is CNS and is Mr. Uh, Scott Rudasil and Rachel Layton represented the applicant. All right, you, you'll be representing the county? I'm gonna represent the county. Right, thank you. Um, is there any ex parte communication on this request? All right, thank you very much. Applicant presentation. Good morning, commissioners. Happy New Year. Good morning. Um, for the record, I'm Scott Rudisill with Blaylock Walters. I've been sworn I'm here on behalf of the applicant. If we could pull up the slideshow there. All right. Thank you. All right, this is our, uh, our development team here. We have uh, Al Livnet and Blair Schlossberg with Mangrove Cove Properties. Um, Rachel Layton is our, is our planner on this project with ZNS. Uh, Jeb Mulock, actually I think Nathan Crott is here today for, for ZNS, uh, is the engineer. Um, Michael Yates is our traffic engineer with, uh, with Palm Traffic. And Joel Christian, our environmental consultant with our Dura. All right, this is the, uh, the project site. It's approximately 57 and a half acres located on the north side of Cortez Road, just west of Pomasola Boulevard. The request is to rezone a portion of the site from NCM and RSF 4.5 to PDR. The majority of the site is already PDR right now, so we're, we're bringing it all under, under unified uh, zoning. And the request is for general development plan approval for 44 townhome units and 104 uh, multifamily units. <coughs> now the site has a little bit of a unique history, so I'm gonna go into that a little bit before I turn it over to Rachel to get into the project. So you'll see here, the site has a, a five acre parcel and then a, a 52 acre parcel that's primarily coastal wetlands. The five acre parcel was the subject of some litigation with the county back in the 1980s, uh, resulting in a joint stipulation between the parties uh, that provides for that parcel to have vested rights to develop at 12 units to the acre and three stories over parking. So several years later, the five acre parcel <coughs> was joined with the parcel that you see to the west it came in as a unified development project. First phase of that project was developed as Renacita, and you see that there, those are paired villa units. Uh, the second phase, which is, which is our five acre parcel, was not developed, it was approved for 44 townhome units at that time. Um, but when they did that project, they established, and you can see where the road stubs out to provide access to the five acre parcel, and that access, those access rights were um, memorialized in the declaration, and so that still exists today. The five-acre parcel does have access through, through Renacita. Um, the five-acre parcel is now combined with the larger parcel for this project. The somewhat unique thing here is our larger parcel does not have access rights through Renacita. So that's why you'll see later in the presentation the, the access is somewhat bifurcated. It, that piece will have access directly to Cortez Road. So with that, I will turn it over to Rachel. I'll be happy to come back later and answer any questions. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Rachel Layden. I'm a certified planner with ZNS Engineering, and I have been sworn. Welcome uh, to the new commissioner. Glad to see some new faces on the board. Um, it's always fun to kind of start the new year with, with fresh you know, attitude and outlook as we take on new projects for the benefit of our community. So welcome. Thank you. So as Scott mentioned, um, I do want to point out that this property, to the larger property right now, has access to Cortez Road. Um, it's just a dirt road right now with a, a, a driveway cut. So our property here, um, again, we have two parcels, and these are within the Res 6 future land use category. The property is also within several overlays. These include the airport impact overlay, 
coastal planning area, and coastal evacuation areas. And really what these mean um, is that the staff has additional review criteria in the Land Development Code and Comprehensive Plan as they review the project. The surrounding area transitions from Res 6 to Res 9, Res 16, MUC-AC1, and retail office residential. So this really allows for an area of mixed use developments and higher densities in this area. So you'll see some commercial and some higher uh, density residential along this corridor. The site is an infill property along Cortez Road and the project does meet the goals, objectives, and policies of the comprehensive plan. So for zoning, as Scott mentioned, we're here today seeking approval of a rezone from NCM, which is one acre of the site, and RSF 4.5, which is over three, just over three acres of the site, and that's of the eastern site, um, which has the majority of the property in the PDR zoning district. The east, uh, sorry, the west parcel is also in the PDR district. And what we're proposing today is a general development plan for 44 townhome units on um, the five acre tract consistent with previous approvals and current land development code requirements, <coughs> as well as 104 multifamily units on the 52 acre parcel to the east. The eastern parcel is largely mangrove swamp, which leaves us only about 10 acres for development um, on uplands for this development. The zoning map again is uh, 3.4 acres for the RSF 4.5 and one for the NCM, which are along Cortez Road. And so we'd like to change those to PDR to be consistent with the rest of the property. The surrounding zonings include PDR, <coughs> EPMU, RSF 6, RDD 6, RMF 6, and RMF 9. And that's consistent with the underlying future land use categories. This range of density allows for a variety of housing products which is, of course is the cornerstone for successful communities as encouraged by our comprehensive plan policy 2.9.1. So uh, the development trend map is interesting because some of it is older than what our GIS map has labels for. And I always find it interesting when we look at projects and see really what's happening along a corridor. Um, and I did come in front of the commission um, for the 24 townhome units that were proposed in 2015 for the site um, and having the opportunity to really re-envision this project with the client to allow for the additional five acres of upland really is kind of an exciting task for me. Um, but in that amount of time, we've also seen approvals for Peninsula Bay come to the commission for approval, and hopefully we'll see some engineering on that soon. Um, and the same thing with Lake Flores, and those are very large projects um, that are on the east and west sides of, of Cortez Road in this area. And really this creates this parcel as an infill parcel um, and we have an opportunity to protect all of these wetlands in this design. So we have several residential subdivisions to the north and south um, and several along Palmasola Boulevard, uh, sorry, Parkway. <laughs> um, and those include San Remo Shores, Coral Shores, Mount Fernand, and there are a number of condominiums of various heights. Uh, commercial development has also occurred along this corridor, including now we have three self-storage facilities, a Dollar General, and several existing older shopping centers. And as I mentioned, we've got approvals for Peninsula Bay and Lake Flores in the vicinity. And those will be mixed-use projects with similar proposed heights as this project. So again, we have two, piece, two parcels of land on the north side of Cortez Road, west of Palmasola Parkway, south of Palmasola Bay. The parcel, the east parcel is 52 acres, west parcel is five. Um, and again, this allows the property owner to re-envision the development potential for this property, which is so something I've been asked for the last, I think, seven years, um, is how do we re-envision it um, to allow for a more dense project so this can be fully developed and realized. So this is the Ardura flux map, and this shows that we have 47.34 acres of mangrove swamps within the 57-acre tract. The pond in the western tract was actually created in the 1970s, so we have a total of 9.27 acres of open land on the site that were disturbed for construction activities following the approval of PDR 0342 and FSP 0546. 0561, actually that was five acres of disturbed land for Gulfview Park, 
with 44 multifamily units. So um, I always like to bring the color site plan um, and talk about how we've put this together. So as you see, we have, um, again, the 44 townhome units on the western parcel and 104 units on the 52-acre parcel. And this allows for a transition from the paired villas, which are three stories, and, and as they move the other direction, they come down in height. But the three, three buildings that are closest to our project are three stories in height, and those are within the Renesita project to our west. So our project <coughs> access um, has been one of the issues that you'll see in the staff report. Um, I think we've worked everything out, but we're reliant upon a, an FDOT permit for access on Cortez Road, as would any project on a state highway. And so that is the primary access for the development and will provide access for the 104 multifamily units. The 44 townhome units will um, also sh provide shared access to 43rd Terrace West, um, and we're proposing to have a gate in between the two projects. So um, I don't know if you guys can see the little white box, but we do have a little, oh, too far. Pushed it too many times, I'm sorry. Um, let me go back, keep going with access. So the Western 44 townhome units will have access both through the drive aisles back to Cortez Road and also through Renesita to its west, back to Cortez Road. And again, we do propose a gate to separate the two communities at the western property line. We understand that the townhome residents will be given um, gate keys to be able to utilize that, and we're currently in negotiations with the prop, um, <coughs> with Renesita. So um, I also want to talk about the density just real quick. Um, again, it's 148 units that we're proposing on the 57 acres, and this gives us an average density of 2.5 dwelling units per acre. And again, using the comprehensive plan for the density calculations is a requirement when we have wetlands that exceed 20% of the site. So the maximum number of units that would be permitted is 159 units. And again, we're proposing 148. Um, there are seven proposed buildings for the townhome units with a maximum height of three stories over parking. The internal access drive for the project is 24 feet wide and adds to the separation between Renesita and the townhome units um, to provide a distance of 117 feet between the structures in each development. There are two proposed multifamily buildings for the 104 units with a maximum height of four stories over parking. These buildings are set back 450 feet from the most easterly building in Renesita. The proposed building heights comply with land development code and will be further reviewed for compliance during the final site plan process. The townhome buildings will be set back 20 feet from one another. The roadway buffer is proposed at 20 feet north of the existing 15-foot utility easement that exists along Cortez Road. This creates a setback of 70 feet um, to the nearest townhome building from Cortez Road property line, and a setback of 152 feet to the multifamily buildings that will be located closest to Cortez, where only a 25-foot setback is required by the Land Development Code. A 15-foot green belt buffer is proposed along the western property line. This creates a setback again of 117 feet between the easternmost building in Renesita and the westernmost building in Mangrove Cove. We wanted to provide as much separation between the units as we could. Project design includes 50-foot wetland buffers along the eastern and northern development limits abutting the mangrove swamps. Open space requirement is 35%, and because we have so many wetlands, uh, mangrove so much mangrove swamp, we have 92% open space, which is well above the requirement. The proposed amenity center is 1.4 acres in size. We do have two specific approval requests. The first addresses sidewalks on both sides of the street. Project design proposes connected sidewalk system as shown in red around the internal driveways. The proposed sidewalks will connect to existing sidewalk system along Cortez Road. A bus stop is located at the entrance of Renesita. So we have um, worked to make as many amenities as we can in this general development plan. And really we've presented a level of detail that is not usually shown at general development plan, but we wanted to provide that information so that everyone was seeing in the public hearing what we were proposing for the development. We're asking for a parking reduction from 2.1 
spaces per unit to 1.96 spaces per unit. Utilities are available for connection. The traffic impact statement has been approved by Manatee County. Manatee County School District provided confirmation that available capacity exists in the service area. And we've worked closely with staff throughout the process. The staff report is supportive of the application. The project is compatible with development in the area and has been designed to meet the requirements of the land development code. It's logical progression of residential development and PDR in the area. And again, this is an infill project. And we respectfully request the Planning Commission recommend approval of this project. And that concludes our presentation today. We have our team here to address any of your questions. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Are there uh, any questions from the board? I have one, I have one quick question. Um, where the access is going to be for not there at 90, not at 92nd Lane West, but at the other access, that's going to be right in, right out only, correct? It is likely that that will be how that is designed. We're still working with FDOT. They have asked us to look at the potential as we come in for permitting for a, I'm going to say this wrong, and so that's why I have Michael Yates here, a designated U-turn lane coming from the westbound, westbound to eastbound travel lane, the southern travel lane, okay. to put in uh, a dedicated U-turn lane and whatever other improvements may be needed to make sure that we have safe access to the site. Okay. So then at 90 sec or 90 <coughs> 92nd Lane West and Cortez and Coral Boulevard, is that a, is there a signal there? I can't tell. There is the, no signal there. Will, I there, will there be a signalized light oh, there? I'm going to let Michael answer some All right, of these thanks. questions. All right, thanks. Our favorite traffic guy. <laughs> uh, good morning, Michael Yates with Palm Traffic, and I have been sworn. Um, so that is an unsignalized intersection. However, there are left and right turn lanes there, uh, eastbound and westbound. Uh, I think we'll probably, depending upon where the access configuration works out, we may need to extend the turn lanes there, uh, eastbound and westbound. But it would allow for safe operation of that intersection. All right. So as much traffic as Cortez gets along there, you don't think there's a need for a signalized light there? Or is that, I, is that a state that's DOT? That's a state DOT. We've met with DOT uh, a few times on this and working through the access configuration and what that's going to actually ultimately look like. Uh, it would not meet turn, uh, signal warrants. Um, just for general purposes, a signal uh, warrant is 53 cars per hour for eight hours of the day, making a left from the side street. And so we'll never be anywhere close to that. If you think for uh, comparison purposes, a uh, Home Depot or a Lowe's with that being their primary access, <coughs> that just barely meets signal warrants. Okay. So just kind of from a scale perspective. So if you're just residential and you're not a huge subdivision, you're not going to meet signal warrants. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I have a question. I'm sorry. Oh, sure. Um, <coughs> so there's 148 units, um, and I understand the 44 townhouses would have access, separate access, but could they also use the, the direct access along with the apartments? Yes. So, so theoretically, it, 100, all units could use that new access point. It, correct. They could all use that, the right in, right out on Cortez. Correct, right. They could all use that. Right. And then the, so really anyone from the West would likely use the 92nd lane. Probably. And because there's a left turn lane there, it's an easy access. Uh, and then anyone from the East would likely use that shared, that direct access to Cortez. <coughs> right now it's limited to 100 units generally by the, the code? I, for a single access. Mm -hmm. Right. And then, so this gives them two means of access. Uh, just the townhouses. Just the townhouses, mm -hmm. but yes. Okay. And also on the building heights, is the parking underground? So that uh, doesn't add a story. Yes, but I'm going to let Rachel address okay. that. So the townhome units will have garages, and the multi-story building for the multifamily 104 <coughs> units will have parking for the first level and then have um, their stories start above that first floor. So the total number of stories is four? For the four over parking for the multifamily building only. And, the, and we did that purposefully to transition the height away from the existing neighborhood. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Leiter, you're up. password. 
Good morning, Rosina Leider, and I have been sworn. I have a really short presentation. Um, you have it. The site is located in Cortez Road in the north side and comprises um, three parcels and uh, um, is more or less 57 acres. No. It's on, uh, the majority of the site <coughs> is on PDR and there is three, more or less 3.30 acres of RSF 4.5 and one acre of MCM that is the subject of the reason to un unify to PDR. The site is within the RESIC future land use category that allowed medium densities and combined with neighborhood commercial services and support uses as recreational uses. And the site is under many of the overlays, the coastal high hazard that is in a little portions that are in green, the coastal planning area that is entirely with, with, within the site, the coastal evacuation area and the airport impact area. The coastal areas, um, the implication is that uh, there are specific uh, design standards for these areas that imply 35% minimum of open space for new developments and uh, other uh, standards, uh, specific standards that this, the plan has to comply that time of final site plan. Um, the request is like assessed to rezone the areas on uh, uh, MCM and RSF to PDR and they are proposing a general development plan with 148 multifamily units. 44 units are in the form of townhomes but are multifamily. There is not parcels of everyone. Looks like townhomes but are multifamily and two buildings with 108 multifamily units, like the applicant says, is four stories over parking. And like I says, there were six allowed for medium density. Uh, to briefly um, summarize the situation of parcel one and parcel two, parcel one is the parcel two, the, oh, was I in trouble, to the, West, <laughs> and the parcel um, has um, vested rights mm. to be developed with 12 dwelling units per acre, and is where um, the 44 townhome town home type <coughs> units are proposed. Parcel uh, one going to be um, developed with more or less 9.2 dwelling units per acre, and the parcel two that is the 52.77 uh, remaining acres gonna be developed with more or less 1.97. The overall density that is proposed is 2.5, that is less to the maximum that is allowed by the, um, the rest six, that is six dwelling units per acre. And parcel two doesn't, ha is not included in the bestest right to be developed by the, um, 12 dwelling units per acre. The applicant is asking, like uh, the applicant pointed, two specific approvals. One, to allow only one sidewalk, instead sidewalk in both sides of the street, what is required for new developments, when, is, uh, when they are located within two miles of the schools, and to um, have one, um, access point that gonna give access to one, 104 units. That is the new access point in Cortez Road that has to be approved for FDOT. The parcel <coughs> one has vested rights to get access through Renacita. But at the time, to answer the question that one of the commissioners posted, when uh, the access in Cortez is approved for FDOT, they can use that access too. But right now, they, the, the parcel one has vested rights for 44 units and to get access via the existing use in Renacita, the existing driveway in the uh, street in Renacita. Uh, the next slide um, show what is existing right now and is to, to the west is the Renacita phase one that has been developed with, uh, I think it's single family homes and the weight of some ones are duplex and uh, village and some ones are detached. 
and the parcel to the right, that is to the east, that was approved for um, townhouse, and uh, I think that the project expired. And for this, the applicant is getting the opportunity to come back. And in the next slide is the site plan. And if you go to the next slide, please, uh, is the standards. <coughs> and like you see, in general, the site comply with all the required standards, are proposing 92% of open space, exceeding the minimum 35% that is required. Um, the sick bags are um, exceeding the minimum sick bags. Uh, the front sick bag, the minimum is 25, and they're proposing 70 feet. And the same, um, the east and west um, minimum side yard exceed the minimum requirements. They are proposing an amenity center to serve, to serve the community. And they are providing the required 15 feet uh, wetland um, sick bag and the wetland buffers. And um, what else? I don't think so. There is anything uh, that trigger uh, further explanation. And in the next slide, uh, <coughs> is in color. You're going to see in blue the area that is multifamily but look like townhouse, the 44 units with vested rights. And in green, the two, um, orange, the two buildings. And the way to do the density calculations <laughs> is somebody is interested in that, that we transfer 20% of the wetlands, and there is 11 acres, and that uh, can be developed with six dwelling units per acre, plus the uplands in parcel two and parcel one, and they gave the total of 159 units, and the applicant is proposing 149, and like I said before, is 2.5, the overall density. A staff is in agreement with all uh, the stipulations with the applicant, and um, if you have any further question, I have to respond. And, uh, and we um, agree that the site comply or appears to comply with all the regulations of the Land Development Code and the Comprehensive Plan. All right, thank you. Are there any questions for staff? Sir. Sure. All right, thank you, Ms. Leiter. You're welcome. At this point, we'll go, we have a speaker card, so we'll go to uh, public comment. Um, I'm going to call up, I have one speaker card for Tracy. Suda Bay? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Thank you. Um, other than that, we don't have a speaker card. <laughs> Anybody else want to? Anybody else want to like to speak on this behalf, on this application? All right. Um, oh, got a hand raise. Yes, yes, sir. Please come forward. State your name and that you've been sworn. Okay. My name is well, come to the microphone, please. Um, my name is Mark Hazel. I have been sworn. I'm a resident of um, Rena Cita to the west and a member of their board of directors. So we have an agreement in principle with Mangrove Cove in the development, and a, but our serious concern is over the access, and we, we haven't got a contract signed with them yet because of that. Um, what we're worried about is that the western access, our access that exists today, appears to be twice the size of the new access that they're proposing, and that the fact that it's only a right entrance, right exit, will make ours the default primary access instead of a shared access situation where both. And we're wondering why maybe the grass median on the center of Cortez Road couldn't be removed and then more turn lanes provided which would eliminate that issue and then if they resize their entrance to be larger then it'll be very similar to ours and encourage less traffic through our entrance okay all right thank you well the applicant would respond to that for you when under it would come up with a rebuttal all right thank you are there any other other questions from the planning commission of for staff or for the applicant no applicant would like to come up for their rebuttal Uh, this is Michael Yates with Palm Traffic. Uh, I just want to address the comment that came up. Uh, so we have met with DOT. We did ask for a that eastern access to be full or at least directional. Uh, they would not allow that. Um, and the reason being is, is the 
roadway is a class five roadway by DOT classification. So connection spacing is 440 feet, which we meet. Um, so, but the directional median or median opening spacing is 1320, so we're significantly short on that. And so we did present it uh, and they would not allow that to be anything different. Uh, so, uh, but we would provide for at the right and right out that they could come out, make a right, and then go to the 92nd lane intersection and then make a U-turn there. And so we would provide a sufficient length turn lane so that they could do that and make the U-turn lane, U-turn there. So not <coughs> everyone would need to come out 92nd lane and try to make a left. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any staff closing comments? Yeah. You have more comments? Yeah, you, you, you good, Scott? I was just going to add, just, just to clarify, the, the comments from the HOA, they're envisioning a scenario, and, and, and our clients have been working with the HOA to establish access so that the entire project could utilize the access through Renesita. So when he's talking about which, which access would be primary versus secondary, he's talking about the scenario where all of the units would have potentially the ability to access through that piece. So we'll, we're still working out the the details of that, but if it happens, we'll we'll work that out with them in the in the agreement. Excellent. All right, thank you. <coughs> any staff closing staff comments? Staff doesn't have any uh, additional comments unless you have questions. Any more questions for staff? Yes, sir. No. All right, thank you very much. I'd entertain any deliberation among the. Oh, anybody else? Well, any, um, I'll entertain deliberation. Um, any any other comments from Planning Commission? I'll entertain a motion or whatever the Planning Commission would like. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. I move <clears throat> to recommend adoption of Manatee County ordinance, zoning ordinance, PDR 21-03ZG approval of general development plan with stipulations 1A through 1A7, B1 through B8, C1 through C2, D1 through D2. Adoption of the findings for specific approval and granting specific approval for alternative to land development code sections 1 LDC section 1001.1C.1 1 to allow the 104 apartments to utilize a single access connection to Cortez Road subject to FDOT approval, LDC section 1001SA1CI to allow the required five foot sidewalk to be located on one side of the internal roadways and drive aisles for the project located within two walking miles of a public elementary school. Thank you. Um, do I have a second? A second. Thank you, Mr. Spock. We have a second. I'd like to call it to vote. All those in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Chair votes aye um, with Mr. Connerly and Mr. Rutledge um, absent. And the uh, motion passes. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm back online. Uh, just in time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank opinion. you. All right. Um, I believe we're up to item number two. Yes. I called the wrong speaker for the wrong cove. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Item number two, PDC 2105 <coughs> CG Four Hammer Crossing, William K. and Catherine L. Marsh, owners, the Ferber Company contract Porsches. It's a quasi judicial case. A reason of more or less 13.35 acres for A1 MCO suburban. Agriculture North Central Overlay to the PDC MCO Plan Development Commercial retaining the North Central Overlay. Approving a, re a general development plan for up to 150,000 square feet of commercial uses. The 13.35 acres is located with the US3 Future Land Use category and is located on the southwest corner of UF301 and Four Hammer Road at 12055 US 301, 5751 Four Hammer Road, and 5851 Bella Road Parish. And it's approved and a schedule of permitted and prohibited uses as voluntary proffered by the applicant and as, as an attached and exhibit B. And the case manager is Ms. Dorothy Rainey. Very good. And Mr. Mark Barnaby is represented the applicant. Very good. Thank you. Um, for the uh, for the commission, have there been any ex parte communications regarding this application? No, yes, sir. 
Okay, seeing none. Um, Mr. Barnaby, how are you? I am good, thank you. <laughs> if you could, please introduce your application. Uh, we'll be happy to do that. Uh, first of all, good morning and Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, I am Mark Barnaby with uh, Blaylock Walters, and I have a master's in planning uh, from Florida State University, for the record. Uh, with me today are, is Ryan Plate of Ferber as, and Will Anderson of Ferber, uh, who are the applicants, Mike Costello of Avid Group, and you'll hear from him shortly, and Michael Yates of Palm Traffic, and you'll hear from him if we need to do that. Uh, <clears throat> I want to thank uh, staff, Dorothy and st the staff. We've worked very hard with them <coughs> to, to get to this point and, uh, and so that they um, are comfortable and uh, recommend the uh, application. Uh, and let's see. There Mr. Barnaby, go. before you, you get into it, have you been sworn? Oh, and I have been sworn. Yes, I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. can't believe I forgot that. Um, <clears throat> I want to, uh, this is the site. Uh, well, let me go to the next one. I'll try to go to the next one. Maybe. Maybe not. It's not. not there we go. All right. Uh, <clears throat> this is the site, as we as was mentioned, this is at the southwest corner of Fort Hamer Road and US 301. And before, uh, this area is developing, as you can see, and we'll talk about that in just a minute in a little more detail. I want to go back in time. Uh, I was born and raised in Manti County, as some of you were. Some of you are, are a little newer to Manti County than that. And in the 1960s, uh, this was uh, a very rural area. It was in the middle of nowhere. <coughs> I used to go by here all the time because I traveled to Tampa. This was one of the main roads to Tampa at the time. And uh, uh, by the time you got out to this part of the county, you were, you were out in the middle of a very rural area. And why is that important? Because the current zoning is A, uh, A1 actually. And uh, that goes back to the 1960s when it was originally designated. It has not changed the designation, but as we will see, the area has changed quite a bit. Next slide, please. Let's jump ahead a little bit to 2003. This is the aerial image in 2003. At this point, US 301 is still a two-lane road. Uh, Fort Hamer um, was not where it is today. It was further to the east. Um, and uh, that Fort Hamer road was still a very rural road and dead-ended literally right into the Mantee River uh, as you headed south uh, because it was a boat ramp there. <clears throat> it was a very agricultural area. Uh, and as you can see on from this picture, there was a tree farm that actually extended off of this site onto where is what is now Lakeside Preserve. Um, it was a very large tree farm, and uh, all the trees that were planted on this site were largely trees that were planted for the tree farm. So it was intended for those trees to eventually be removed. Next slide. Thank you. This is 2008. Now, by 2008, <clears throat> you will see that Lakeside Preserve to the south was being developed, 301 is now four lane, and uh, the tree farm is no longer being maintained. Um, it's starting to, to <coughs> dilapidate. Uh, Fort Hamer Road has not been relocated as of yet. Let's try it, next slide. Uh, this is 2014. Um, Lakeside Preserve is largely developed at this point, um, and Fort Hamer Road has been relocated. And you can, as you look at these images, you can see that uh, 301 has become uh, even more developed. Uh, the turn lane up to the, on the north end has been, been uh, enhanced, let's put it that way. Um, and you're starting to see, see quite a bit of development in, the, in this area, up in the parish area. Um, this is all significant because this area changes. It is also during this time that Fort Hamer Road um, is now being connected across the river over the bridge, and that is a significant change to this particular location. Um, and this is a, going to be a extremely busy intersection as time goes on. <clears throat> okay. You can also <coughs> begin to see some of the development to the north. Um, and this is a cur current aerial image. It doesn't uh, show all of the, the what's going on to the north of the site, but uh, we've got the 7-Eleven going in across the street uh, on the north north west corner of this intersection. Dollar General is as well on the northeast corner. So a lot of things are going on. Development is beginning to occur in this area. <clears throat> this is the site plan that was approved by Planning Commission just a few years ago. Uh, this is not what we're intending to do exactly, but I do want to point out that this was recommended for approval by the Planning Commission in, at that time. 
for the site. The current zoning on this, uh, the current comp plan designation on the site is UF3. Uh, it is uh, very near the Res 6 to the north in the parish area. Uh, the importance, the comp plan does allow commercial, uh, me medium commercial on the site up to 150,000 square feet, which is oddly enough exactly what we're asking for. And, uh, and uh, this is an appropriate uh, uh, use under this comprehensive plan designation. Next slide. Uh, this is the current zoning on the site. You can see there's a number of PDCs, including the PDC directly across the street on the north uh, to the northwest. Uh, PDC up along there. Uh, you've got the parish village area, and you can see the PDR Lakeside Preserve. Now, I, I do want to note something, and I'm, we're going to show this in much more detail in a minute. I want to compliment Lakeside Preserve. If there is a, um, a standard for uh, buffers, uh, I, I give Lakeside Preserve credit for that because you're going to see one of the best <coughs> buffers I've ever seen uh, maintained for uh, adjacent to a property. Uh, this property, uh, the, again, the PDC that we're requesting um, and the uh, general development plan that we're requesting for 150,000 square feet is appropriate for this, this particular location, very appropriate for this location, as I indicated. This is going to be a very busy intersection as time goes on. Uh, next slide. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike Costello, and then I'll come up with some comments after he gets finished to show you and discuss the site plan. Good morning. If you could state your name and that you have been sworn. Good morning. Mike Costello with Avid Group. I'm the engineer of record for this project, and I have been sworn. Thank you. Uh, as Mr. Brumbry introduced the project, I'd like to just point out a few of the uh, existing conditions on the property just to familiarize yourselves. Uh, so currently there are a few uh, remnant buildings left over from when this was previously a tree farm. As you can see to the south of the property, approximately south two-thirds of it are rows of uh, existing somewhat mature trees, pretty monoculture out there. Uh, they were planted in, in rows and there's some small drainage and uh, ditches in between them for, uh, for drainage. Um, as you can see to the north is, uh, call it to the north, is 301. Uh, there's currently one driveway off of 301, and on the, call it the east side of the property, there's two driveways off of Fort Hamer Road. Uh, on the southeast corner of the property, there is a uh, stormwater management facility that is owned by the county and uh, basically handles most of the runoff from Fort Hamer Road. The property currently uh, is, is relatively level. The stormwater generally flows towards the south. Uh, there is a swale located along the northern side of the residential properties there that intercepts some of that flow. Um, next slide, please. This is our proposed site plan. It's a general development plan, so as you can see, there's not a whole lot of detail as to what we're proposing in the future. Um, generally, we're looking to construct uh, more of the intense commercial uses along 301, likely in three or four out parcels along there. And the southern portion of the property uh, would likely be larger, um, more like big box or something along those lines where it's uh, a little bit less intense use uh, towards the residential properties. We did have a pre-application meeting with the county before advancing any of our applications uh, and received feedback that there were some concerns under the prior application that was shown previously uh, for the residences and the, the separation between their their units at, or their backyards and the, the back of our property. <coughs> As such, we proposed uh, our stormwater management system to be located along the, I guess called the southwest corner of the property and along the southern boundary of the property. This is an approximate size. Um, this, this pond has been, uh, is sized appropriately for this development. Um, and we basically located it there to push our development further to the north and provide some additional separation from the residential properties. Uh, as suggested by staff. Uh, in green, uh, the light green highlighting around the perimeter of the property are the proposed buffers um, for the project. So within the north central overlay, uh, there is a requirement for a 50 foot buffer along uh, thoroughfare roadways. Uh, it's under our understanding that those buffers have been uh, granted relief on prior commercial applications by this board. Uh, so we're requesting a 25 foot buffer there. That is one of our specific approval requests. Also to note on the northeast corner of the property, um, closer to the intersection, there's a little jog in our property line. 
there's actually a remnant triangular shaped parcel between the county's right of way and our property. It's actually a leftover piece from the property owner on the opposite side of uh, Fort Hamer for when the county acquired that right of way. It just left a small triangle there. Uh, that's important only because it ties into part of our specific approval request where uh, we're trying to provide a consistent buffer along there and, and not um, treat that little piece as a side yard, even though it's, it's really in the, in the roadway there. Um, next slide, please. So, did you want to talk about this or do you want me to? Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, our client actually visited the property uh, just yesterday, yesterday um, and took some additional photos out there to basically show and demonstrate what, uh, what the buffer looks like <coughs> is on the south of our property. So these photos are actually the, the existing buffer that is on the north side of the residential properties. So the fence that's out there is, is on, along the residential property lines. Then there is a drainage easement, which is basically the, the open space that you see in between there. And then uh, looking at the, the first picture, on the right-hand side there is a hedgerow with the uh, trees that have been planted and provide a buffer to the residential property. Those are all located on the residential property currently. Uh, next slide, please. Again, uh, additional photos of that area. Uh, it's important to note that. So there, there's currently, there's a fence line, there's a drainage swale, there's the residential buffer, then there's our, our property line between the two uses, and then we're proposing an additional buffer on top of that to, uh, to enhance that area as required by the NCO. And then our pond is located to the north of that. So we really tried to stack everything to increase the separation between the residential and the, the proposed commercial uses. Next slide, please. So as I discussed earlier, we had a specific approval request. Um, this has kind of been uh, you know, pared down a bit, but in general, it's to reduce the uh, required thoroughfare roadway buffers from 50 feet to 25 feet um, with a little bit of additional for the, that one triangular piece of property. So it, it, it states that there's a reduction of the setbacks um, just in, in that one general area. But for the most part, it's 25 foot roadway buffer is what we're requesting. Uh, the next specific approval request we had was per LDC, there's a maximum of 10 parking spaces within a, a row, a maximum of 10 parking spaces in a row. Um, some of the tenants that we are currently trying to get under contract uh, have a request for a little bit more than that so that they don't wind up with a landscape island at their front door. Um, so as such, we've requested a 15 as the maximum, but only in one singular location. So that wouldn't be throughout the project, it would just be in one instance. And as, as part of that, we've agreed to still provide the same amount of landscape material, just split up into other, other um, islands. Uh, and staff has uh, supported both of those specific approval requests. Uh, at this time, I'd like to hand over the presentation to Mr. Yates for, to talk about the roadway. Uh, good morning, Michael Yates, and I have been sworn. Um, so as you can see uh, from the graphic here, uh, Fort <coughs> Hammer is currently in the design process uh, for the extension going north. Uh, this is including some uh, significant improvements at the intersection of Fort Hammer and 301 today. And we've had some conversations with DOT Related to the access, again, access to the state highway was challenging on this one. We had to go to AMRC to get the right in, right out access to uh, 301, so we have that additional connection. Uh, next slide, please. And um, this is just the general roadway network, um, but I would be happy to answer any questions you have specifically about it. But again, we're proposing the uh, alignment with Bella Road for the full median opening onto Fort Hammer. I can go back one slide. Um, you can see that connection at the southern end there. And then we have <coughs> an 
a right in right out in between there and 301 and then a right in right out on 301 we will be extending the right turn lane on 301 at Fort Hammer the eastbound right and also extending uh, the eastbound right uh, into the subdivision entrance to our west as part of our agreement with DOT. Do you want to talk about the roadway improvements at all? I, I think we're out of time. I, this, is, okay. this is the graphic that kind of shows what that configuration looks like. And as you can see from the Bella road alignment at the southern end, uh, we would be providing a northbound left and a southbound left turn lane there uh, to allow for safe movement. And so this kind of shows what those additional improvements look like uh, to both 301 and to Fort Hammer uh, with the proposed improvements that are being uh, constructed by the county. To wrap things up, um, I do want to note we did have a neighborhood workshop. Um, and uh, one of the things that we talked about was preserving perhaps some additional, some of the existing trees. All those trees were planted as part of the tree, tree farm, but we are going to try to preserve as many of the existing trees as we can in that buffer area. Um, I think that would be helpful. And if we have to plant additional trees, we'll, we'll try to offset their, their proposal. Um, again, this is a major thoroughfare intersection, and um, this is consistent with your comprehensive plan and your land development code. And uh, we uh, request uh, approval, recommendation of approval. And if you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer those. Very good. Thank you. Um, before I ask a question, can I get help from staff? I got uh, logged out and the password I was given last meeting doesn't work. <laughs> um, <coughs> just uh, maybe a question regarding the roadway improvements that were mentioned. Um, it, it appeared that there was just a continuous uh, right turn line. Is that kind of the result of the improvements? Thank you. Uh, on 301, yes. That is what it became essentially going uh, all the way back uh, to the west. And so it would just be essentially <coughs> a continuous right turn line. I know DOT has gone away from that in the past, but working through AMRC and with DOT staff, uh, we figured that was the best configuration and it allowed for the best circulation. Very good, thank you. And um, regarding the, the buffer on the major thoroughfare, um, can you, is the criteria, the, the, um, the code criteria, the, the requirement, is it, is it uh, specific to use? generally or is it just a kind of a blanket it's um, it's part of the nco uh, designation um what we intend to put the same kind of plantings we just you can do that in a much shorter <coughs> area and i think the county's actually looking at changing that or eliminating that requirement but wanna... uh, yeah as mr Brumbry stated uh, again this is mike costello with avid group uh the plant material that's required as part of the 50-foot nco uh roadway buffer would be planted just in a 25 foot buffer okay. so same amount of plant material okay uh mr smock i said um you had shown a preliminary plan that you said it had gone through an approval process when when did that happen approximately three years ago uh, that's about, right. about three years ago three years ago all right so that's kind of the the, the idea has been floated out there for a while then oh yeah the, uh, the, yes and certainly this is a that that was done by a prior prior developer but uh but obviously at least that time, the Planning Commission thought was a uh, commercial was an appropriate use for that site. So, right. The, um, I'm sorry. Was the roadway buffer reduced with that approval as well, from 50 to 25 feet? I don't know the answer to that question. You know that? I, I believe it was. Uh, I can't answer that 100 percent again. That was done by a prior, uh, previous developer and engineer, but I believe it was reduced. Could you but make could you sure make you're sure on the yeah on the mic? Thank you. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I believe that was reduced for the for, uh, prior application. Also of note, the uh, if the NCO is removed from the property, the, the required buffer actually is reduced even further to 20 feet um, once that overlay is removed. Would that affect the other buffer adjacent to the residential? <coughs> uh, I believe that would be reduced. Uh, so currently the NCO requires a 20-foot perimeter. Uh, I think it's called a green belt buffer. Right. Um, and I believe that would be reduced to 15, if I remember correctly, if the NCO is removed. Um, I think I want um, to clarify something. Yep. Uh, 
If the project is approved right now with 25 feet reduction and 20 feet green belt buffer or whatever is in the plan, the applicant has to comply with that. If the MCO is removed, and they have this approval with 25 feet, they have to come back to request reduction of the buffer. It's not automatically that we're going to give entitlements to project that has been approved. If it's approved with 25 feet reduction and they would like to reduce to 20, they have to come back in front of we, the board and we, request that. We have no problems with the 25 feet along the roadway and the 20 in the back uh, on the south side. Um, that we're just noting that for the record. That that's that's what that would be basing answering the question. And uh, and Mr. Barnaby, the is it also your understanding that if if the NCO is removed and um, this plan is approved, you'd still do the um, vegetation within that 25 foot that's consistent with this application? That's what we're proposing, yeah. Okay, thank you. Just for clarifying the record, the individual that was answering Ms. Keba's question was Mr. Mike Costello. Yes, correct. Thank you. Very good. And uh, Mr. Barnaby, one additional question. Um, with regard <coughs> to the uh, the landscape islands are is it uh green space that's being like the green space that would be in one island is being added to another so you might have a larger island as opposed to just the vegetation being moved over to that i'm going to let mr costello answer that question very good hi again mike costello from avid group and yes as you stated the the amount of plant material would be re redistributed between the adjacent islands to uh, provide the same total square footage. Green space, right? Yes. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, any additional questions? Yeah, Mr. Okay. Mr. Ron. Mr. Barmy, good morning. I have a quick question for you. Um, one, thanks for having a neighborhood meeting. Those are important in any plan that comes forward. We appreciate that. Uh, the question would be is that, I know this is a GDP, but how far do you think are the distances between the residential property and a commercial building will be on this site as far as distance from that line or that fence line? Well, we're not, we're, we haven't totally designed the site out at this point. I know it's going to be at least 50 feet uh, for that distance. I think we could be, we could indicate that, but uh, at least as to any, any, uh, I think that's right. <coughs> The problem is we, we're in the process of designing yeah. it. We've got some people that are they're interested, but go ahead. Uh, yeah, as, as again, Mike Costello, mm -hmm. have a group. Uh, as previously stated, that there is a required 20-foot uh, perimeter buffer, uh, and <coughs> the rear yard is 25 feet, if I remember correctly, so we couldn't be any closer than 25 feet to the rear property line. So if you, so you have the, um, the, the, the other, the residential property's buffer, plus your 20-foot buffer, plus the water, so you think that is what totals up to about 50 feet or more? It would be more than that. It, it would likely be more than that, um, but the, the, basically the, the residential buffer is on their property, right. so, but yeah. from the residential fence lines to uh, our development, at least 45 feet is, is the minimum. And if that's the rear of those buildings, could there be dumpsters or other things behind them? I mean, th that's possible. Again, we haven't designed anything in that location at this point, so it, um, that's kind of speculation. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm getting that that's concern of the, the mm -hmm. residents is no, not just the lighting, perhaps, but also odors and noise. So. Uh, um, with regard to the Southern access off of um, Fort Hamer. The parcel line doesn't go up to the right of way. Who owns the parcel of land? Uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. The parcel line yes. for the application does not go up to the right of way. Yep, it it appears. So. Hi, uh, Michael Yates with Palm Tree. <coughs> uh, that is owned by Manatee County. It is a, a Manatee County pond. Uh, we have had some initial discussions with them about relocating the pond and reconfiguring the pond uh, to allow that full access configuration. I assume that's the piece you're talking about. Right. Uh, basically, what right do you is granted to the applicant to cross that pro property? If it's a if it's a DO, I'm sorry, a county pond, 
it is, is it, a county pond. Does it have an access easement over it? Over uh, it, public uh, access? We're only. Uh, I do not believe so at the current moment. We've had discussions with the staff mm -hmm. uh, about that as we're going through the process. Uh, they have seemed amenable to <coughs> modifying the pond to allow for that configuration. And it's just until we get into the engineering mm -hmm. and figure out what that relocation looks like, that's where we are at this current point in time. But everything, every discussion we've had with staff, they've all been amenable to reconfiguring that pond as long as the storage that is occurring within that pond remains to allow to incur uh, to allow that same storage to be within the new pond configuration okay and with with the reconfiguration would it be a an easement granted or or is there going to be it's, property conveyed so it ultimately and that's part of what we've been trying to work through uh the thought process may be is that that becomes the right of way stays the right of way but then the it could be a land swap with the county uh, and the new pond configuration be conveyed to the county as part of that should that not be granted is there a solution with regard to access that is still consistent with the rules and regulations um, driveway it, separation yeah I mean that's part of what we've been trying to work through and as being in the GDP process uh, it's been a little challenging without going through the full engineering yet mm -hmm. to get to that point of figuring out what that configuration is and what the pond configuration is and what the site configuration is uh, during a GDP process but we've had those conversations been working with staff okay I think we'll get to a resolution uh, that works for both parties okay thank you <coughs> Anything else for the applicant? Thank you very much. Thank you. This will go to a uh, staff presentation. Good morning, Dorothy Rainey for staff and I have been sworn. Thank you. Um, my presentation probably won't offer too much more than what the applicant has, but um, so the request before you is to rezone approximately 13.35 acres from A1 North Central Overlay Suburban Agriculture North Central um, to Plan Development Commercial retaining the North Central Overlay and approval of a general development plan for commercial retail uses and, assort and uh, associated infrastructure. The site is three parcels, again 13.35 acres. A1 zoning with no central overlay in the UF3 feature land use category. And it's currently vacant, but as the applicant indicated, there are a few buildings on it. Feature land use is uh, UF3. And the zoning again, A1. There's an aerial zoomed in as well as zoomed out of the site. The surrounding uses to the north is US301 right away and a convenience store with gas pumps, which is the 7-Eleven. It's zoned PDC. To the south is the residential subdivision of Lakewood, Lakewood uh, subdivision, or Lakeside, I'm sorry. Um, to the east are large lot residences zoned A1. And to the west, there's the entrance road to the residential subdivision, as well as a stormwater pond to the west of the roadway. Um, there's a few photos <laughs> looking northeast and southwest along Fort Hamer Road frontage. And then looking southwest at the site, Looking northwest across Fort Hamer Road at the residences. Looking northwest at the intersection of 301 and Fort Hamer Road. And looking southwest along 301 and the lakeside entrance. Looking southeast at the lakeside subdivision itself and the entrance. And, whoops. <laughs> <coughs> it went too far there. Huh? South, looking south and southwest into the site itself. The site plan, as the applicant had shown, um, it does show the um, general general location of the stormwater pond, the configuration, again, it's conceptual at this point, but configuration of the, um, the subdivision that they're gonna do, the out, out parcels or lots, there's three of them along US 301, and then there's the larger remaining part that's gonna be a separate parcel. 
Um, there's two access points on Fort Hamer, as the applicant indicated. One is a right in, right out that's in the middle of the frontage, and then the one that's going to align with um, and go across the, where the stormwater pond is. I believe that's um, Bella Road um, is going to be a full access. Um, stormwater, as they mentioned, it's in the southeast, um, I mean, southwest corner, as well as all along the south property line to allow for some more separation from the residential uses. Um, let's see, so there's what I just went over. The specific approvals, it's just two of them. That middle one needs to be removed. Um, but the 50 foot roadway buffer reduced to 25 feet. And as the applicant indicated, that's customarily been what um, projects have been requesting all along when they're in the north central overlay. And then the sec uh, 701.3A4 is to allow more than 10 consecutive parking spaces without a landscape island. And of course, they provide <coughs> whatever would have been required normally for the um, plantable areas um, in another location, let, such as enlarging an, a terminal landscape island to make up for it. The positives are that the site is located in a at a commercial node, which is appropriate for commercial and retail development. It's also got frontage on 301 and Fort Hamer, which are both classified as arterial roadways. The commercial development is occurring along US 301 corridor in, in, in this intersection specifically, so timing is consistent with development trends in the area. Negatives are that the site abuts single-family residences to the south, and there may be potential negative impacts relative to lights, glare, and noise to the residential areas. But mitigating measures are they, do, they are required to provide a lighting plan in compliance with the LDC at final site plan, which makes sure they don't have light trespass or cause any issues with that. And also the site provides required buffers and screening adjacent to the residential development. As the in, uh, applicant indicated, there's going to be extra separation with the buffer, the stormwater pond, et cetera. So, so oh, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> So it's staff's opinion that the request for the rezone to PDC with the general development plan and the specific approvals with stipulations are all in compliance with both the comprehensive plan and the land development code. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Rainey, the, um, there was a, a slide that said there was a reduction or change in the front yard. Yeah, um, that, that um, is probably, we decided that's not necessary. Yeah, it was for the building setback, but with that little triangle, there, there's no way they can get closer. You know, it's it's only like a 36 foot segment, and it, it it's a triangle, so there's no way to place <coughs> a structure closer than what it's required to be set back. So, so it, it's a setback, not a not a right, not a buffer with not a landscape buffer with. It's a building setback. Yeah. Okay. All right. I usually associate yards with. <coughs> with platted lots and not with commercial parcels. So. Yeah, but no, anything that's a platted lot, whether it's residential or commercial, has setbacks or yards. So yes, a yard equals setback. <laughs> right, has yeah. the, I guess the applicant can um, maybe answer this question, but have you had discussions regarding platting of this property? Um, they, I, I think they, being it's a general development plan, they wouldn't have, um, provided any information about that, mm. it would be a, the next step would be a preliminary plat, preliminary site plan combination, and okay. then final site plan, but and then of course the next step is the final plat. But but it's not being it, there's nothing that would require no in that this they document. Okay. It, no. Should they choose to do something different? Right, they they are able to do that in the future if they want. And then uh, the last question I have for you is um, with regard to the uh, uh, the location of the southern access on the eastern boundary mm -hmm. if that were to shift does that require <coughs> does that require this come back in uh, I think generally one of the few pieces of information that's somewhat binding in a GDP is the access points mm -hmm. is it is there enough flexibility where that could be moved should it be necessary based on uh, whatever might be worked out with the county and relationship to that pond well I believe that it would be um, the, the answer to that would be governed by the um, section in the code about the, the thresholds that if it, if it does not exceed the thresholds that are listed, like more than a you know, certain amount of um, change 50 feet from the, pro the project boundary, things like that. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not, I can't think on the top of my head now if there was something that would specifically speak to this change, but 
um, I can check on that for you. That that's yeah. fine. That's fine. It, um, but it, it would be regulated by what's in the code. Yeah. The, the, yeah. Um, yeah. If they, if they <laughs> exceed the the threshold when they make that change, and, and then it would require coming back to the board for sure. Yeah. The difference between maybe a major change or a minor change. So. Yeah. Yeah. It has thresholds. That okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Any additional questions for staff? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, we're going to go ahead and open this um, application up for public comment. So if there's anybody in the audience who wishes to come forward to speak to this application, if you would, you have to come up, uh, state your name, and that you have been sworn, and you'll have a opportun <coughs> an opportunity to uh, three minutes to make your statement. I can't and, um, Is the mic off by chance? Did it? I don't know. <laughs> Go down. We didn't uh, <laughs> turn the mic off, did we? The mic is on. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm very soft-spoken. <laughs> <laughs> I am Kara Byers, and um, I have been sworn in, and um, the uh, um, the people have uh, Farber have come to talk to the community, which I'm very, very appreciative. I've thanked them for that, for um, coming to speak to us and making this known. Uh, I live on Bella Road. And um, my biggest concern, and I know they're working with this, but I just, I guess I want to put a face to uh, this development. Um, it used to be Fort Hammer Road, now it's Bell Road. But my biggest concern is I know this uh, development's going to come sooner or later. I mean, whether it's tomorrow or next year or five years, this is coming. Um, so I, I told um, them, Ryan, that I would like to work, or I hope our community will work with them to make it um, to be the best, you know, for the community. Uh, I've been in um, Parish for about 20 plus years, and so as, as we all know, it's just changing. Um, so I would like to keep it as rural as we can in the looks and not make it a uh, sorry, a Cortez or a Bradenton where it's wall to wall. It would be nice to keep the wildlife that we have there. Um, but my biggest concern is I have spoke to, spoken to them is as you come out of Bell Road to make a left-hand turn, it is extremely dangerous there. And, if, <coughs> um, and I know this is not right now the, at the planning, but if ever a uh, development goes across where that entrance is, it's going to be extremely dangerous just to make that left-hand turn. Uh, this morning, <laughs> uh, as I was even leaving out, and um, there's not even that much traffic, because there's a curve heading north on Fort Hammer Road towards 301. I don't know if anybody is in this area, drives, or familiar with Parrish, but because there's a, just a little bit of a jog in the road, people don't see the light. And I noticed that they made a light a little bit closer. <coughs> so it's like as you're coming around the corner, maybe you can see like this little tiny light before you see the real light. And the person didn't see the light and thinking, I guess it's yellow, maybe I can make it. And he, as I'm sitting at the red light, he went around me into the oncoming traffic, went through a red light, and I'm like, okay, I wished I had a camera because I can say this is my concern. It happened this morning. <laughs> so again, it's probably not on the development, but I know as far as it, it's a whole, it's a group, it's a community, it's planning, it's, it's everyone working together to make an area the best that it can. And I know uh, we all want it to look our best, and I would hope that uh, as we will go through this, uh, again, I know part of y'all probably don't live in that area, but I would hope that we work together so it's like when you look back, like at the Fort Hammer Bridge, I know we fought that forever, but now it's beautiful, it's gorgeous, and it, it worked out great. So I hope it's the same with this development, that the lighting, the way it's situated, the roads, uh, like for us trying to get out, um, cars that will come out and be hitting um, the lights um, to Bella Road, or if there's ever a gas station or a a restaurant, it'll be just kind of like, like we've been talking about the buffers and just the access of getting in and out. So I don't really per se have any questions. I just wanted to, like I said, put a face to this. And like I said, I do appreciate them working with us. So if y'all have any questions for me. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, could you please clarify, are you talking about 56 in Fort Hamer? 
Excuse me? What intersection are you talking about? The same um, thing, the Fort Hammer Road and... Um, 56th? I live on Bella Road. Um, with regard to this application, where is Bella? Okay, so if you look at uh, their plan, um, Bella Road would be like the southeast of their property. Okay. So Bella Road used to be Fort Hammer Road. Okay. Um, so my uh, road was, I was always known as Fort Hammer Road. And then when they did that jog, they changed their name. Okay. And so right now what people are doing, <coughs> I don't know why because we're not even that busy yet, but people will not go to that light they'll come down Fort Hammer Road just to not sit with two cars sitting on a traffic light. Okay, so I, we're, I know where you're talking okay, about Okay, so we already so, have, thank you. so if y'all go through that, mm -hmm. slow down. Yep. <laughs> so thank if y'all have any other questions. Thank you very much, thank you. Thank you. All right, is there anybody else who wishes to come forward and speak on this application? Okay, seeing no one else come forward, we're gonna close the pub public comment portion of the hearing and open it up for discussion, deliberation, additional information necessary for uh, making a decision. Anything? Okay, I'm gonna open no, it. Sir. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Rutledge. No, I don't have any comments. Okay, thank you, thank you. All right, uh, I'm gonna open it up for staff. Is there any additional information necessary for uh, the record? Okay, thank you, thank you. Mr. Barnaby, uh, closing comments or uh, rebuttal? Uh, real quickly, I, I, I do appreciate uh, Ms. Byers' comments. Uh, we will continue to work together and work with our, with our neighbors to the south and to the east. Um, we will have a lighting plan, obviously, and as you know, uh, the county has some of the most restrictive lighting requirements in the, in the state, and we will comply with those. So with that, uh, I have no other comments. Thank you. Very good, thank you. All right, with that, we're going to close the public hearing and we'll open it up for discussion, deliberation, or uh, the chair will entertain a motion. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion. Mr. Ron. Based upon the staff report, evidence presented, comments made at the public hearing, and finding the request to be consistent with the Manti County Comprehensive Plan, the Manti County Land Development Code, as stipulated herein, I move to recommend adoption of Manti County Zoning Ordinance Number PDC 2105CG, approval of the General Development Plan with stipulations A1 through A3, B1, C1 through C3, and D1 through D5. Adoption of finding for specific approval and granting specific approval to land development code section 40312D4 to allow reduction to require 50 foot road buffer to 25 feet and for the segment of approximately 36 feet to eight feet and 7013A4 to allow more than 10 consecutive parking spaces without a landscape island. Very good, we have a motion, is there a second? Second. Mr. Ross, second, any additional discussion? I, I guess just one comment I would have is, since there's getting, they're getting a reduction in the roadway buffer, if there's any chance to add to that buffer against the residential or to mitigate in any way, just um, <coughs> to that plan, just to be really, conscientious of the residential that is to the south. Right, very good, thank you. Anything further? All right, we'll call the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> Opposed, like sign. Chair votes aye, motion passes 7-0. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we're gonna go to the next application. Uh, Ms. Slider, I think you said you had a time constraint. Is Are you still good? Okay, well, uh, with that, um, we need to take a 10-minute uh, recess, and uh, it's right now it's almost 10.30, so we'll come back at 10.40. Perfect. So, thank you. Thank you.
All right. Let's get the. Divide the other mention. <laughs> and uh, let's get started again. <laughs> All right. I believe we're up to item number four, PDMU 18 05, paren Z, paren G. Uh, Mr. Rigo, welcome aboard. <laughs> Thank you. Um, first, I, were you sworn? Yes, sir. Okay, very good. Thank yes, you. Thank you. Um, <coughs> So let's go ahead and uh, if you could please introduce item number four into the record. Item number four. State your name for the record, I'm sorry. Thank you. I only had your last name. James Rigo from staff. Very good, thank I you. I have been sworn. Uh, item number four, PDMU 18-05 in Prince Z, in Prince G, Ellington Cove, North River Partnership, LLC. Uh, a rezone of approximately 80.82 acres generally located at the southwest corner of Interstate 75 and Mendoza Road, also known as 37th Street East, and commonly known as 5005 37th Street East Palmetto, from A1 Suburban Agriculture to the PDMU Plan Mixed Use Development <coughs> Zoning District, approving a general development plan with two alternative development options, Option A is for a maximum of 532 multifamily units, 78 single-family detached units, and 30,000 square foot of neighborhood commercial uses. And option B for a maximum of 780 residential units and 30,000 square foot of neighborhood commercial uses, utilizing a mixed-use density bonus and approving a schedule of permitted and prohibited uses as voluntary proffered by the applicant and attached as Exhibit B. Uh, this is a quasi-judicial case, and for staff uh, is Senior Planner Charles Andrews, and for the applicant, Ms. Carol Clark. Very good, thank you. Good morning, Ms. Clark, how are you? I'm very well, thank you, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Carol Clark with Medallion Home, and I'm here just to introduce this project. Um, this has been a long time coming. Um, it was started uh, three years ago, and um, Christy Barrero, our planner with Height Design, will explain some of the history with that. But things have evolved from when we started the application to where we are now. Um, and I forgot to say whether I've been sworn or not, but I have been sworn. Thank you. Um, so um, we'll go through that, and um, thank you very much. Before you... Um uh, I'm sorry. Uh, before we continue, I just would like to confirm with the um, the board that there have been no ex parte communications on this application. Nope. Nope. Oh, very good. All right. Thank you. Mr. Rutledge? He's probably still on in recess. So. <laughs> no, I, I have had none. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Sorry. Good morning, Christy Barrero with Height Design, and I have not been sworn in. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so. Anyone else in the room who has not been sworn, please stand at this point. You're not, uh, you're not by yourself, so. <laughs> Do you swear or affirm that the factual statements and representations you are about to make to the Planning Commission are truthful and accurate? I do. Thank you. When you step to the podium, please state your name and if you've been sworn. I have been sworn. So as Carol mentioned, uh, this is the Ellington Cove project. Um, in June of last year, the comprehensive plan amendment was approved from residential three to residential six and nine. And now we are before you for the rezoning to a PDMU. The property is located south of Mendoza Road, west of Interstate 75, north of US 301, and east of Ellington Gallette Road. It is comprised of six parcels, totaling approximately 80.82 acres. And as I mentioned, it was previously residential three and was recently approved at residential six and residential nine future land use categories. Currently the zoning is agricultural suburban. And I wanted to walk you through some of the approvals and developments in the surrounding area. The first is Willow Walk, 
which was approved in 2004, I'm sorry, 2014 as a PDR zoning for 100, I'm sorry, 718 <coughs> single family detached residential units. Silverstone, which was formerly known as Willow Hammock, was approved in 2015 as a PDR zoning for 299 single family detached units. Trees Direct, which is on the east side of 75, was approved in 2010 for a comprehensive plan amendment from residential three to residential six. And then in 2012, the zoning was approved as PDMU for a maximum of 500 multifamily units and 150,000 square feet of commercial and office uses. Tuscany Lakes is an apartment complex that's directly east of us, east of the interstate with 348 apartment units. And then the Gulf Coast factory shops are south and east of Interstate 75. The Florida International Trade Port was approved in 2010 for a comprehensive plan amendment from residential three to mixed use. In 2018, an additional 50 acres was added to that application. And in 2019, the general development plan was approved for 2.5 million square feet of warehouse, light industrial, distribution, commercial, and office. And that's currently under construction. Our Lives Community to the southwest of the property was approved in 2019 for a PDMU with a maximum of 720 residential units and 150,000 square feet, square feet of retail and office and 900,000 square feet of industrial. And the paddocks was approved in 2006 for a PDR with a maximum of 264 residential units, both detached and multifamily. So as you can see from this graphic, the subject property is literally in the center of all of these recent development approvals. The request for planned development mixed use is in conformance with the surrounding development and their approvals. The subject property is also located in the urban development area boundary and will utilize existing and planned infrastructure in the area. And speaking of that infrastructure, uh, the county has uh, a north-south road on their future thoroughfare map. It, it will bisect the property. Um, the dashed line <coughs> is the approximate alignment. And then you can see that the yellow is portions of the road that are constructed, and the red is portions of the right-of-way that have currently been dedicated. Through our property, this road is currently known as 49th Avenue East. And so with all of that, we are proposing a plan development mixed use zoning for this property. When we came before you, as well as the board in the summer last year, um, you all believed that this was the appropriate location for additional density and uh, actually wanted to know if we could have more density than we were originally planning. So with that, we went back to work a little bit and came up with two options for our zoning plan. The first is option A, which allows for 532 multifamily units, 78 single family units, and 30,000 square feet of neighborhood commercial. So the neighborhood commercial would be located at the intersection of 49th Avenue and Mendoza Road. The multifamily would only be allowed on the east side of 49th Avenue adjacent to the interstate. And then the single family would be on the west side of the property. And this will provide a good transition from the interstate and then moving west to the lower density west and north of the property. We also have an illustrative concept plan that we wanted to share with you uh, that gives a little bit more of a visual of what could be developed here. Again, multifamily adjacent to the interstate, um, neighborhood commercial at the intersection, and single family units on the west side of 49th Avenue. <coughs> Again, 78 single family units is the maximum. The minimum lot size is 6,000 square feet with a minimum lot width of 50 feet and a two story maximum height. Multifamily apartments would allow for a maximum of four stories on the east side of 49th Avenue. And then the neighborhood commercial was approximately three acres, 30,000 square feet. And the maximum height would be two stories with an optional second story office. And an ALF would also be allowed. And this could be on either side of Fort Hamer Road. 
Second option is option B, and this was where we may use the additional density bonus that we can get for being at the activity center node. That node is at the intersection of Mendoza and 49th Avenue, two thoroughfares, um, and it extends 1,500 feet from that intersection. So as you can see from the half circle in the project. Uh, there's only 11 acres of the site in the two uh, southern corners that would not be considered in that activity center node. So we're proposing seven, 780 units here and 30,000 square feet of neighborhood commercial. And you can see in the table on the right hand side that on the, the single family, detached and attached, be allowed on either side of 49th Avenue, but the multifamily is still only going to be allowed on the east side of 49th Avenue adjacent to the interstate. Um, and ALF is also allowed as well as non-residential uses. Again, those would just be at the intersection of 49th Avenue in Mendoza, and anything on the west side of the property would be limited to two stories. And again, this talks about the activity center a little bit more. Um, Manatee <coughs> County has a map that shows where two existing intersections or future intersections in this case um, meet that Mendoza and 49th Avenue are sh is shown as one of the activity centers um, in this graphic. This is another illustrative plan for option B. Sorry, this one's not in color. Um, it does show, again, the multifamily on the east side of the property, and this time, instead of single-family detached, we're showing duplexes on the east side. Again, um, single-family detached, 50-foot wide, 30-foot um, wide, uh, are, are allowed on either side. Um, also, single-family semi-detached with a minimum lot size of 25 foot wide or single-family attached with a minimum lot size of 16 foot, feet wide would be allowed on the east or west side of this project. In this illustrative plan, we're just showing it on the west side. And then, again, the um, multifamily <coughs> on the east side and this uh, Graphic shows that, again, the neighborhood center could be on the west side. Um, if the developer wanted to put it there, again, it would be a maximum of three acres. And those single-family detached, semi-detached, and attached uses would be allowed there as well. So we do believe we are consistent with the comprehensive plan and the land development code. Uh, we believe that this project is compatible and consistent with the surrounding area. There are public facilities in the area as well. We're located within the future development area boundary. Um, and again, we believe that we're compatible with the existing development. Uh, again, we also believe that this is the appropriate timing as there are other residential uh, developments in the vicinity of the project. We also did have two neighborhood meetings. Again, we mentioned that this project's been going on for quite some time. Uh, we had the first one in February of 2021, and that was to talk more about the comprehensive plan amendment. We also did touch on the zoning, but because it was so long ago, we wanted to go back and have a second neighborhood meeting, so we did that last week with residents as well to explain um, the zoning that we're presenting to you today, options A and options B. So we did send out over 90 letters for both of those meetings within 500 feet of the subject property. And with that, um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Very good, any questions for the applicant? I have one. Um, what kind of comments did you get from the citizens or did you get a good turnout for that? Um, we very, had very few residents for both of those meetings. Um, some of the concerns were traffic um, and then density, but again, with apartments on the east side of the interstate, we felt that this was appropriate. And really from the very beginning of the process three years ago, we came in with only the 40 acres that would be east of 49th Avenue um, and west of the interstate. Uh, but when we were talking to staff, they said that they really wanted more of a transition <coughs> to the 
residents that are to the west of the property. They didn't just want apartments and then have it as the rural, the larger lots that are there today. Um, so we went back at the uh, and purchased more property so that we could have that transition and not just have apartments next to the single family, but have more of those single family uses on the western side so that um, that would be more compatible with the area as well. Thank you. And what will make the decision between the two options, or is it market-based? Market-based, and um, the applicant may not be the developer of the property, so whoever it would be sold to. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, none of the uh, plans that you shared for informational purposes only represented the uh, optional mixed use area that's shown in the GDP on the west side of, um, what is that, 49th? Yeah, there 49th. was one. Okay, I might have missed it. Oh, oh yes. it's less... Uh, so right on the west side, it would still be the intersection of Mendoza and 49th, mm -hmm. just, you know, flipped to the west side of that street. Okay. So it would be approximately three acres in either instance, about 30,000 square feet. So it just depends, again, on who the final user is. Um, and, of course, you know, are you, do you want to be on the driving home side or the going to work side, depending on what use is there. Okay. And then... Uh, I don't know that we've had many applications that were within the uh, I-74, I-75 entrance corridor. What are the constraints associated with that? So there is a 100-foot buffer along I-75 that uh, there will not be any buildings in that setback area, I should say. Setback, okay. Mm -hmm. Is there a height restriction associated with the corridor? I don't believe there is, but we have committed to a maximum height of four stories for the apartment buildings. Okay. All right. Anything further? Very good. Thank you very much. All right. We'll go over to staff's presentation. Hi. Good morning. Charles Andrews, Senior Planner with Building Development Services, and I have been sworn. Thank you. Um, let's see. There we go. Thank you. Uh, this today is uh, Ellington Co. with PDMU 1805ZG. Uh, the applicant did a great job of kind of summarizing everything that we're working with them on, so I'll, I'll make this quick. Um, as you know, it's 80.82 acres located south of Mendoza Road and west of I-75. Uh, there's a zoomed-in map and an overall map there of the area. <coughs> Uh, here's a Google Street View. This is looking off of Mendoza Road at the site currently. Uh, just a previous approval, um, as you folks know. Uh, this came as a large-scale comprehensive plan amendment under PA 1805 uh, before the uh, Planning Commission on March 11th. and was approved by the Board, County Commission, <coughs> June 17th. And this went from Res 3 to Res 6 and Res 9. Uh, the previous uh, future land use category was Res 3, as you can see from the graphic. And it was approved with Res 9 right next to I-75, transitioning down to 6, and then 3 uh, a little further west there. So it was 6 and 9. <coughs> uh, history on the zoning designation, it was A1 since 1990, uh, A1 Agricultural Suburban. Uh, here's a uh, graphic here of the existing zoning. Like I said, it was A1, and it's in the I-75 entrance, ENT, uh, entranceway. Uh, the request before you is a rezone with general development plan approval for two alternative development options, options A and option B, going from A1 to PDMU, which is planned development mixed use. Uh, one thing here is the activity node, and this is from the comprehensive plan uh, operative land use operative provision A2, uh, establishes a medium commercial project can be defined when located within a Res 6 or Res 9 future land use category and can be established within 1,500 feet of two functionally classified roadways. <coughs> I'll show you a graphic here in a little bit, but that would be Mendoza Road and 49th Avenue East Extension. Or per the comprehensive plan, increase in density for residential uses is permitted for mixed-use developments located within an activity node. Uh, here's that graphic that the applicant was showing you. I kind of outlined this. So this is... Uh, out of the 80 acres, it's 70.17 acres, about 87% is located within that 1,500-foot activity center node. Uh, proposed thoroughfare map, uh, 
running right through bisecting the property kind of between the res nine and the res six kind of offering that that step down and that, that buffer there with the, the road uh, for development option a 532 multifamily units with 78 single family detached 30,000 square feet neighborhood commercial uses gross density is 7.84 it also includes an assisted living facility at one far uh, here was the breakdown kind of between the west and the east uh, using 49th avenue east extension um, as that west east divider there with the different uses um, let me jump over here all right a little bit busy map here but in a nutshell <laughs> uh, option a here is shown and the red outlines are where the neighborhood commercial could go on either either side of that uh, and on the east obviously we were talking or the applicant rather was talking about multifamily being allowed there uh, the assisted living <coughs> facility could be there that be it could be greater than two stories uh, uses could be greater than two stories there however going over on the west side that's where I say uh, have the residential entitlements west there uh, it just says you know less than two stories uh, for the assisted living facility and the single family detached and multifamily wouldn't be located on that side oh, let me go back okay um, oh, one thing here on the note, just like I said, to ensure compatibility, 49th Avenue East Extension serves as that east-west divider for those specific entitlements. Um, option B would have 780 residential units with a mixed-use density bonus. It would uh, keep the 30,000 square feet neighborhood commercial uses. It adjusts that gross density to 10.02 per acre, and the ALF or assisted living facility would still be at 1.0 FAR. Uh, here is that table that the applicant provided showing you that east-west breakdown and then here is that graphic uh, one thing I, I need to point out on the east side as um, you had uh, alluded to regarding the entranceway there's a hundred foot buffer so that little green line is a little bit thicker there kind of showing you where uh, that buffer is and you have the green belt buffers that are part of that plan development zoning district and then the greenway buffers in the middle there along 49th Avenue East extension to kind of give you that, that visual there some specific approvals that were uh, requested here. Oh, we have three. Uh, the first one's LDC section 401.5.B4, and this is to eliminate the requirement to have the main entrance of the building facing the street. So in this case, facing Mendoza Road, thought it more appropriate to face internally. Uh, next up is LDC section 402.7.D.7. This is to reduce the required front yard setback from 25 feet to 23 feet for single family detached units with front loaded garages. And we have seen these request, that request come in from other uh, projects. Uh, last but not least is LDC section 1005.3. This is to reduce the required number of parking spaces for multiple family dwellings from two spaces per dwelling unit to 1.8 spaces per dwelling unit. And that would in include <coughs> guest parking. And we have seen that request as well with other projects as of late. Uh, here's a map of the surrounding development the applicant had shown and let me go here so to the north we have willow walk and then we have uh, silverstone formerly known as willow hammock to the south uh, we have some a um, real quick this is pdr zoning here to the north to the south we have a1 large track residential which ranges from one to eight acres uh, to the east we have i-75 on the other side we have tuscany lakes apartment <coughs> here's that picture of the apartment complex and then to the west, we have a few uh, large track residential and then a, it's Tidewell uh, Memory Care um, Center, excuse me. Public facilities, schools in the area, uh, Blackburn Elementary, Buffalo Creek Middle, and Palmetto High. Uh, nearest transit stop is east across the site, across I-75 rather, at Tuscany Lakes Apartment Complex on Mendoza Road. Uh, several parks are located within the five mile radius, Gamble Plantation, Buffalo Creek Park, et cetera. A positive aspects of the application timing appears to be consistent with the development trends in the nearby area serving as infill development uh, the pdu pdmu zoning allows the board to accept voluntarily pro offered proposed stipulations to ensure compatibility uh, as shown in exhibit b uh, negative aspects there are some established lower density residential subdivisions uh, to the north uh, mitigating factors the proposed extension of 49th avenue east will ensure green belt buffers along the roadway, providing further compatibility through buffering and screening between the proposed uses. Uh, the eastern portion of the site is partially located within the designated I-75 entranceway, and it shall adhere to Land Development Code Section 900 entranceways. 
Uh, in conclusion, the request appears to meet the applicable policies of the Manatee County Comprehensive Plan and Land Development Code regulations. A request for approval of PDMU 1805, Parent Z, Parent G, approving a general development plan with two alternative development options. And I'm here if you have any questions. Very good. Any questions for staff? I guess the roadway improvements and when they're going to happen. <coughs> from okay. Mendoza through. I think we have someone from transportation here that can answer that for you. Uh, can we get clarification on which roadway network? Just the whole area. The, just I've, the area. I was by there okay. a couple of days ago, and it's always seems backed up. Yep. Good morning. Uh, I'm Mary White from Transportation Planning at Public Works, and I have been sworn. Thank you. Um, so, just for clarity, the road that has been uh, dubbed as 49 Avenue East extension under the current updated thoroughfare maps is called 51st Avenue East. So is a minor technicality. However, uh, just for the record, I want to state that. Um, the alignment of uh, 49th Avenue East, which now is 51st Avenue East, uh, was uh, informed by upcoming project like this one. So. Some of the alignments that you see there uh, take into consideration that uh, new projects that are coming in this area uh, uh, <coughs> taken into consideration. Regarding the, uh, the roadway, uh, there is no uh, uh, planned uh, or they are not part of the CIP at the moment. Uh, but as the project progresses and Bear in mind, this project is at the GDP rezone phase. As the um, uh, project progresses, uh, further details can be provided. Very good. I guess <clears throat> what's happening at Ellington Gillette Road and Mendoza Road is in that area. Any improvements? Uh, Ellington, Ellington, yeah, so there is a, a, a CIP project uh, at intersection of Ellington and Mendoza, uh, uh, in, in, but mostly is intersection improvement um, uh, <coughs> I don't know if I answered your question. Well, it just seems like it's always backed up there. I think there's just a stop sign, four-way stop there. Yeah, so that's, that's a, a plan signalization that's going to come up there. Okay. Yeah. So, and just to uh, clarify, uh, most of the, um, um, this is a GDP with rezone. Mm. So uh, this project will come back again for an FSP level analysis. So further details will be provided and analyzed. Uh, and at the same time, we have to take into account projects that have been already approved but not yet built. So there are reserve trips that may cause uh, this deficiency, which is uh, what we dub as background traffic. <coughs> if I reiterate what you just said, this road, Ellington Gillette, has no current plan for change. Is that the correct? No. That's incorrect. That's there is a plan. Correct. And just give me one second, I'll bring my my exhibits and, and I can share with you. When would that plan, that's okay, when would that plan be enacted? Uh, I think I should, uh, let me bring my, okay. my documents in that. Thank you. All right, and um, in addition, uh, maybe specifically if you could speak toward uh, to Mendoza closer to I-75 and then further over to the east, if there's been any um, consideration or contemplation of improvements in the in the future and maybe with the timeline. I know many times these projects are five, 10, sometimes 20 years. They're looking out ahead. Just um, let us know what those timelines might be. So, uh, Yeah. 
<coughs> Correct. So this is an exhibit from the uh, county CIP, and it it's showing uh, Ellington Gillette Road and Mendoza Road, and um, so there is some kind of improvement that have already been uh, programmed that includes left turn lanes and uh, signalization. And, the, uh, and, and uh, for clarification, it's a little hard to see. It, that's at Ellington, G Gillette, Gillette and, and Mendoza Road. Mendoza, okay, Correct. signalization project Correct. has already yes. been. Um, I'm sorry, what was the timeline again? I so, uh, <coughs> from, from um, I think that the design uh, seems to be completed and this must be uh, going for construction uh, to start uh, 22 uh, uh, and, and 25. Okay, all right, thank you. Now, Mendoza is a two-lane road. Is there any thought on making it a four-lane? So. If there's nothing in the uh, yeah, work so, plan. So currently is um, existing um, a two-lane collector road um, in the current uh, <coughs> map, but there is a right of way of 120 feet uh, reserved. And the, so the comprehensive plan, the thoroughfare maps, that's a, uh, is that a collector? What was the? Collector road, yes. Yep, so, okay. So it's, it's planned to be a collector, four lane collector and 120 foot right no, away. No, I said two lane collector. Oh, two lane collector, two -lane okay. Collector. All right, thank you. It's currently a two lane collector, but yeah. it could be a four lane or uh, not planned. Well, I, what, what I see from the um, recently adopted map is, uh, I see it's two-lane collector. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, is, there, is there additional capacity contemplated on the comp in the uh, thoroughfare plan? Or is that, is that what's actually in the plan now? That's what is in the plan now. Okay, all right, and then, um, with regard to um, the road that's currently called, what is it, 49th? Um, there are portions constructed, <coughs> right away dedicated, and toward the north, uh, um, when the applicant was showing the development trend maps, there were quite a few projects that would Po quite possibly facilitate additional right away. Has the right away been identified, and uh, to extend the network to the north? Uh, that information I'm not 100% uh, certain. But one, one, what, what I know is mm -hmm. the alignment for 51st Avenue is what's the 49 uh, mm -hmm. currently. Um, the alignment has been made in such a way that takes into account the existing or planned project like the one we are discussing now, uh, so there is adequate right-of-way provided. <coughs> but in terms of whether the right-of-way has been acquired or is dedicated, I don't have that information at the moment. Yeah, I, I, not so much acquired or dedicated, but at least planned as kind of more Yeah, more in, my in question, terms of yeah. plans, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, all right, thank you. Any, uh, any additional questions for staff? Maybe somebody can help me. I'm a little bit at a loss. Mm -hmm. I don't remember how many units you're going to put here, but it doesn't sound like we have adequate road ability to put the people on the road. You're talking about a two-laner, which is a disaster now, unless it's planned on a four, and you can remind me how many units are going here. I don't think that's going to work. Am I wrong? I, I the don't know. units, uh, uh, I will let the applicant. <coughs> I think it might be more appropriate for the applicant to answer that, that, that question. That would be great. So, yep. Would the applicant care to answer? Right. Um, just one additional question. I, I think we all know that Mendoza is a flyover. Is there ever been any discussion or deliberation of maybe making that a uh, an access point from the interstate? 
Has anybody heard anything like that? <laughs> so again, there was two options. This is Christy Barrera from Height Design. Option A had um, 532 multifamily units and 78 single family units. And option B had 780 units total, a combination of multifamily and single family. And we also have our transportation engineer that can hopefully answer some more questions. <laughs> All right, thank you. Good morning, if, if you could just state your name and that you have been sworn. Good morning, my name is Alex Anaya with ESRP Corporation and I have been sworn. Thank you. Okay. So regarding the question uh, about capacity on Mendoza Road, so to give you an idea, the section between 49th Avenue and I-75, it has, uh, the existing volume is 648. The vested trips, which are the trips from other approved projects, are 130 and the project traffic will be 149. So the total future background traffic will be 778, and the future total traffic will be 927. The peak hour two-way service volume, meaning the capacity for this segment, is 1580. It's 1580. So based on the analysis that we did, uh, Mendoza will have sufficient capacity. Now when 49 comes in, uh, that will add additional capacity and trips will divert, they will use 49. So it, it is supposed to relieve, um, it will be a better situation. So as, as far as Mendoza Road, uh, our analysis showed that there will be enough capacity. Okay. And, uh with regard to the the signalization of Mendoza and Ellington and Gillette, what, what type of impact would that have on the flow of traffic or how traffic would flow in those areas? We, we did uh, analyze the intersection. Um, we came up with a set of improvements. And as Marie mentioned, there is a funded uh, CIP project that will signalize the intersection and will add improvements. So we believe the improvements that will come with that project will be sufficient to keep that intersection working at an acceptable level of service. We, right. we did the analysis and we got level of my, service D, uh, which is... My question isn't related to the intersection. It's the link between the, the, the nodes. It, does, it, does signalizing an intersection have a benefit with regard to the... the um, the links in between the intersection? Oh, yes. Uh, yes, because uh, by signalizing the intersection, we will improve delay at the intersection. So that will uh, improve the capacity of the segment. Mm -hmm. You know, in arterials, when we have <laughs> signals, the signals are, are, are a big part of the capacity. Uh, the, the intersections are a big part part of the capacity. If, if you reduce delay at the intersections, then the overall capacity of the arterial improves. Okay, all right. Thank you. And um, you mentioned uh, constructing um, new segments of roadway have a beneficial effect on existing segments of roadway. Can you explain what you mean by that? That would be the new corridor, the, the 49, uh, which is going to be a new north-south corridor, will add uh, capacity and will add uh, a new route. So some vehicles will use that roadway, and that will relieve traffic on other existing roadways. So potentially trips that are occurring on Ellington Gillette might end up on 51st or 49th, depending on what the final... Yeah, depending where they are going, yeah. that will be okay. easier for them to use that New All right. way. Yes. So I guess timing is probably going to be the question related to the construction of the network. So, yep. okay. Thank you. Any additional questions yeah, for? I want to ask my question again. <laughs> so, Ellington, Gillette, and 301, and Mendoza. These are all D roads currently. Ellington, Gillette. Let, 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 let me let me take That's a look. That's okay. Just do Mendoza. Is it a D road or is, what is it? You, you're 
Are, are you asking about the intersection of the roadway segment? No, I'm asking about the road. The it's a two-lane road. It's an A, B, C, or D. What is it? The classification. Okay. Um, Ellington Gillette between uh, 17th Street East and Mendoza Road, for instance. Uh, our forecasted level of service is C for future background traffic and D for total traffic. Okay. Now, if you go north on Mendoza, yes, uh, it is uh, the future. There is a lot of a significant amount of vested trips on that segment. Yes. It's a very significant. So it will fail under future background conditions or future total traffic conditions. So there, is a, there, will, there will be a deficiency. However, this deficiency will, be, will not be caused by this project. It's a deficiency that will be caused by future background traffic. There will be a deficiency, however. Yeah, so, <coughs> so we, we did the analysis and we proposed some improvements at the intersections. Um, we believe the funded project the CIP funded project at, at Ellington at, and Mendoza will be enough uh, to make that intersection work properly. And then there will be some additional improvements needed at Ellington Gillette and, and 69th Street. Yeah, and who will make those improvements? The county? Uh, the, these improvements, we, we outlined, we mentioned the improvements in the, in the report in, the, in our TIS. Uh, but those, as I mentioned, those improvements are due to future background <coughs> traffic. So uh, because of this, the, the project will not be, this project is not causing those, um, is that deficiency will not cause that deficiency and it will not uh, be. Just to clarify your, your answer, you said those are future background traffic and Mr. Roth is asking uh, whose responsibility? So if it's future background, is it the county's responsibility to provide improvements to the roadway network? Oh, I, I, I will allow Marie to answer yes. that question. Yeah. So, and hang uh, tight just one second. The table that's on the overhead right now, just for the, the commission's benefit, is on page 32 of 39 of the staff report. So if you want right. to look yeah. there, that's, that's also there as well. Yeah, it's an excerpt from the staff report. So the key question here is, uh, about background traffic. What background traffic is, is trips from uh, already approved but not yet built developments. So every time a project comes and it's approved and they get a CLOS, certificate level of service, there are certain amount of trips that we reserve for them for capacity purposes. And just to give a broad context, uh, the trips we are talking about are PM peak hour trips which is, goes from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. So that's the, what we believe the most congested, and that's what we track. So background traffic uh, is not the responsibility of the applicant. It's vested. It's pro it's, even if we don't see them, the trips have been approved, the, and they are uh, they're going to come. And if, if any improvement is triggered due to background <coughs> traffic, it's the county's uh, responsibility uh, in, in, in some form or, or other. Uh, okay. So what you're telling me, if I hear you correctly, we know we're going to have an inefficient, deficient road. It's, it's going to be much better than a D, which it is now. It's only going to be two lanes, not four, and we're going to accommodate 800 units with I don't know how many people. So in my language, that's me sugar. So, uh, the Mendoza. So this the level of the adopted level of service of this of this of this road segment or this link with the project traffic is still a D. Maybe I don't understand English. It's undefendable. Eight hundred units times X number of people, and it's going to be a D two lane road. Come on, give me a break. Um, with regard to the information that's provided in the uh, report, 
Um, typically, there's a traffic analysis that's prepared, you know, uh, maybe a traffic impact statement that's prepared. Then when it goes to construction, there's a more um, a, a detailed analysis that's performed that might in identify improvements that would be proposed to uh, provide either capacity uh, improvements to a roadway network or operational, <coughs> operational improvements to the network. Has there been an analysis that was provided to um, the county at that level for this? So, and, and I go back to the uh, first statement I made. Mm -hmm. This is a GDP with reason. Right. So the scope of the traffic impact analysis is to gauge uh, where there is capacity, where there is deficiency. Yes. But when they come for FSP, they will go under a, a closer scrutiny uh -huh. to see if there is any deficiency and what's causing this deficiency on who's going to be responsible. But, uh, so there is a second layer of filter that goes when they come back again for yeah, FSP. My, my question is in order to get an understanding if in the future when it's analyzed, there might be requirements for improvements that are not required at the GDP review level. Correct, that, but right. without the traffic study being done, it's pure speculation at this right. stage, yeah. So to say that this would be adopted, uh, if, if adopted and constructed, there would be no roadway improvements, is that correct? I don't think it's timely to, to ask that right. question. I, right. I don't think it serves the purpose of the of my, the analysis. my question is, when will the applicant know what roadway improvements would be required? If I, I may, I would, yes. if I may, I think, I think that the, yeah. the expert has testified now several times that he's indicated that there yes. will be a, a subsequent traffic impact study mm -hmm. at the PSP and the FSP phase that will allow them to better analyze that. Right. Uh, the staff report also indicates that as well on, on 32 of 39 now. Right. Uh, unless there's something different or something additional you can add, please, please do so. No, I'm, I'm trying to get the uh, information that the commission needs without providing testimony. So. Yeah. No, if, if I can help you clarify some, yeah. I, I'm, I'm happy to. Well, Mr. Chair. Mr. Rutledge. I, I think the challenge is a little bit that the staff cannot estimate what the needs might be without specific information. However, right. I think Mr. Ross' experience is showing us that with that much acreage and even the possibility of development, you've overextended a road that doesn't have capacity even as it sits today. Mr. Roth, is that correct? <coughs> That's but, correct. And well, my fear is once, he's, once do we go through a front of the Board of comm Commissioners, they're going to laugh you right yeah, out. Yeah, uh, hold on. Let's, uh, let's Let's uh, delay communication between the commissioners until we deliberate. Um, I, th I think it would be more appropriate to get the testimony. Apologize. And, and then we'll, we'll open it up for citizen comments, and then we'll deliberate. Again, I, I, I think everybody has an opinion. Uh, I'm sure everybody or most of us have driven through there, so we, we have uh, personal experience that we can share when we do deliberate. So um, with regard to the, the testimony, again, just to wrap it up, now is not the appropriate time to determine the the potential or the need for improvements correct correct and i i think you testified that um there's a uh it, it's not a f a well-functioning uh roadway network in this area it's it's might be consistent with the adopted level of services but there are proposed improvements that would make it a more functional roadway network. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And, and just to clarify, <coughs> the, when we give it a designation as D, C, and so on, mm. this is very crude generalized level of service analysis. And um, there are ways to kind of delve deeper to see if there is, uh, uh, to gauge if there is indeed a deficiency when it's, when the generalized level of service can show sometimes otherwise. Okay. All right, very good. And like I said, I think we, uh, Mr. We beat, the, yeah. we beat the dead horse. Thank you. So, does the final site plan come back above the planning commission or is that approved the internally? Commission. No, the final site plan is the technical review. Right. So. But it doesn't come back to the planning commission. No. 
So this is our last chance at this. Correct. Uh, well, I, I, I would, uh, I'll let Mr. Rigo maybe answer what, or make the Mr. statement. Mr. Velez line, yes. yes it, it will have to come back. Okay. They're doing an FSP. Yes, sir. But okay. Mr. Rigo, um, for clarification, every project that has improvements, if it's a GDP, it has a final site plan and there, the evaluation occurs at that time, correct? That's correct. Yeah, and it, even if it's a PSP that has a traffic study that travels with it, that still gets analyzed at the final site plan uh, time, right? The answer again is correct. Okay, yes. all right. So, all right, it, it's just an additional timing. So, all right, um, I'm sorry, uh, were there any other questions for other folks on staff? Mr. Rigo? Chair, it will be an FSP, but it will be administrative. Yes, yes, got it. No, understood, thank you. Um, where, where are we in the process? So, and any other questions for staff or the, I think we were with, we were talking to staff and it kind of went back to the applicant, now it's back to staff. So, are you, <coughs> Did you get every, all of the information out that you needed for the uh, 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 presentation, your presentation? Okay, thank you. All right, we're going to go ahead and uh, close that part of the um, hearing and open up uh, public comment. I have one speaker card, and I, I think you've already went through a dry run, so this is, <laughs> this is for the record. Uh, Tracy Sudeby, if you could, please come forward, state your name and that you have been sworn, and then we'll open it up to anybody else who wishes. <laughs> good morning. Hi, my name is, good morning. My name is Tracy Sudeby, and I've been sworn. Um, just wanna put a little, uh, Good morning, and ladies and gentlemen of the planning board. These are the homes and land west of Ellington Cove planned development of five and 15 acres, including a 14 acre lake and a hospice. To be a good neighbor, we would like four things. A 15 foot wall buffer on the western boundary to alleviate construction noise to us as neighbors, and also, which is right here, a 15 foot wall. <coughs> and also to mitigate the noise and visual disturbances of the accessory road that will be constructed to, th to 301, also known as 49th Street East, which is also very close to the Mendoza Road overpass. We also would like to have low lighting as we have multiple nesting birds in our 14 acre lake, two pairs of great blue herons, sandhill cranes and multiple ducks, and also an occasional juvenile or mature eagle that comes and fishes in the lake. Also, we have multiple ospreys that fish in this lake. Um, we'd also like to have this property be a no-burn property, as the smoke from, comes from the east most of the time. As neighbors, <coughs> including hospice, we don't want to smell smoke from 80 acres being cleared. This also will stress out our nesting birds. They are mulching property to be cleared for a subdivision across from the Ellington Outlet Mall. Please mulch this property and do not burn. This is a massive and excessive development. From what I understand from staff was 10 units per acre. <coughs> this property would be more conducive to our, the neighbors who are, who are landowners, as you see 15 to 20, uh, five to, to 20 acres over to the west side I'm sorry, <laughs> conducive to the neighbors who are landowners if it was reduced to two to three units per acre, as this property should be single family residence without commercial buildings or apartments. In conclusion, the neighbors would like a 15 foot buffer, 15 foot wall high buffer on the west side, <coughs> low lighting, no burning of trees or shrubs, and single family homes. And thank you for bringing up the traffic issues. It really is, it's a two lane road. We have a pasture over here on my property. We had 
We did have horses at one time. We could still get horses and put them back in there. Whether they'd expand that to four lanes and cut into our pasture, it's possible. But one, one last thing I would like to say. Lastly, I would just like to say, again, just because there's a hole in the donut doesn't mean you have to fill it. Thank you. Um, if you could, could you please provide your um, graphic to... Um, they got it. Okay, very good. Thank you. Actually, before you go, ma'am, yes, I did sir. have a question. Uh, yes, is it Ms. Sudeby? Sudeby? That's correct. I'm, I'm over here. Up there. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Yes, I'm, I'm coming I'm over from the, back. the corner. <laughs> it sounds like coming the voice is carrying from somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe I'm a really good ventriloquist. <laughs> That's Talking. right. Um, when you say the neighbors, are you representing uh, an association of some sort, or are you well, just uh, if you look here at the map here, we, we aren't a whole lot of neighbors. <laughs> uh, I, I think his question: Are are you officially presenting yourself as representation? Uh, myself and my neighbor, Miss um, Cooley, and her husband. If you me. are officially, you have to provide documentation. So, are you here individually, or I am here individually? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Next. All right. Uh, thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. Uh, again, that was the only speaker card I had. But if there's anybody else who wishes to come forward and speak on this subject, please do so now. All you have to do is walk up there and state your name and that you've been sworn and you'll you'll have an opportunity. Good morning. I'm Donna Cooley and I have been sworn. Thank you. Um, as you heard, I'm a neighbor with, uh, with Tracy. Uh, I live on Mendoza Road, and I thank you very much, Mr. Roth, for addressing the traffic. Um, I've been <coughs> to a couple of the meetings. I'm st I don't understand what the transportation conversation was. I live on Mendoza Road. I know what the traffic is. It's horrible. Fortunately, I'm retired. I don't have to go to work, so I can conduct myself in between the peak zones. But if you put and put more than 700 more housing, Willow Walk is, was 700. Silverstone, they say, is 400. But they're also building west that's gonna, it, that is hooked up to Ellington Gillette. So that's 1,200 buildings right there. And then you have other projects that are being proposed. Mendoza Road is a two-lane road. They have put um, turning lanes in it, which helps. But on the corner of Mendoza and Ellington Gillette, there's a four-way red light. Now, the safety of it is ridiculous. People don't know how to use the blinking red light and take turns. We've had several accidents there. You're increasing the traffic on that road to Ellington Gillette. I don't know how 49th Street is going to um, affect the traffic zone, the traffic flow, but I, I, just, I just see it's gonna be more of a disaster. And again, we are the whole of the donut. It doesn't need to be filled. Thank you. Um, it, it, and along with, um, I live on the pond. I am, okay, thank you. Uh, I am this property right here. And we have wildlife out there. We have cows that come off to us uh, that are ours, but is using our pasture. But, you know, wildlife is, I mean, I can see the decrease of birds that have been in the pond that come to our property. There's another uh, negative for another development to be put on this road. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is yes, there anybody else in the audience who wishes to come forward and speak on this application? Anyone at all? Okay, seeing no one come forward, we're gonna close the public comment portion of the, uh, of the hearing and open it up um, for additional questions to staff, to staff or uh, does staff have anything additional that uh, might be pertinent?
Oh, hi, Charles Andrews again, Senior Planner, uh, Building Development Services have been sworn. Thank you. Um, just a few points here um, on the site plan, just to, to point out uh, what the neighbors were discussing there. Uh, there is a 15 foot green belt buffer that's shown along the property's western boundary. It's not a wall, but just to call that out in the site plan. Um, and then, you know, we had the comprehensive plan amendment that approved to increase the density. And because it's an activity node, it's, it's appropriate for that increase in, in density. So just wanted to throw that out there. And, uh, just to clarify, yes, um, the 15 foot green, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the, uh, landscape buffer, right. the green um, buffer. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, planted with vegetation, including trees. It would have, yeah, and have those finer details in it as we get to the, the PSP, FSP submittal. But yes, there would be, there'd be planting that'd be required in there. Right. And I, I think I took the, uh, the neighbor's comment to mean a 15 foot tall wall. That, that's what I was saying. I was just letting you know that there is going to be a, a, a green <coughs> buffer, just not a wall. Right. Okay. And uh, do you know if uh, the maximum height of walls allowed by the land development code? I could pull that up. I think it's. Five eleven six. I could double check. Real quick. I, I I just was wondering. I, I don't I don't think they allow anything. Oh no, not at fifteen feet. No, sir. If yeah. you're looking I think at that, so it's either I think six, or six or eight. feet. Yeah, six or eight. I think six. So, so. But, so it's that just for clarification. Sure. Six yeah, foot. It was six max yeah. by county rules. Yeah, it's under five eleven of the code, but yes, yeah, six feet, I believe. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Wahid from Transportation Planning again. Thank you. Um, the issue of traffic has been raised from the public, and I just want to kind of give a brief uh, explanation. You're wading into this again? <laughs> yes. So <coughs> one item I failed to mention is um, there is a, a dilemma where there is growth and there is the need to provide infrastructure. And oftentimes this is constrained by resources. So with these two items, they have to go hand in hand somehow, mm -hmm. but uh, y the way traffic flows is, uh, is depending on the, the availability of uh, facilities, correct? Mm -hmm. And when, whenever there is some kind of grid network where the, the public or the users have options to travel through different nodes, this kind of relieves from one uh, congested road to another. So as this 51st Avenue is, comes along, uh, it will create some kind of uh, alternate route to uh, relieve some of the congestion. Uh, the, the issue will be about timing, but the, the intent and the plan, as is shown in the map 5C, shows this uh, intent to provide uh, relievers uh, to the to the what had, <coughs> what's causing this congestion. So um, a, again, just for clarification and explanation, traffic is typically a discussion related to concurrency. Is that correct? Correct. So concurrency is um, something that a project provides to mitigate their impact on whatever might be the discussion. In this case, it's it's the roadway network. If, <coughs> if the impact of the project is, if the roadway network is already strained and the project comes in, it's is the concurrency process doesn't require that project to fix the network that Correct. already is constrained. Is that, is that the Correct. way it is? And, but just also to give it a preamble, right. this project is not applying for concurrence. No, I, I know that. Okay. I know that. I'm talking about the future, what, yeah. when it is evaluated. Um, with regard to the review, con uh, the concurrency review, is that, is that dictated by state statutes? Concurrency? Yes. Correct. Right. So if the county... Um, How, however, uh, so con concurrency uh, is the the counties uh, the the process. The process, yes. yes. So uh, I I want to um, I'm not 
certain whether it's state mandated now, uh, the uh, concurrency. Right. Uh, let me ask my question and then either maybe you can answer, uh, county attorney's office might have an opinion. Where I was trying to get is an understanding if the county has a right to exact an improvement on a roadway network um, to, to if it's not, uh, if there's background traffic, which we had testimony, there's already background traffic. If the county has the right to exact something from the applicant or would that violate state statute? That's the question I'm I, asking. I can answer that question because yeah. that's definitely a, I think <coughs> a critical legal uh, question. So an exaction for something that is an externality not caused mm -hmm. by the proposed development would not be legally correct. Right. And so I think what's going to come up in the analysis at the PSP FSP phase is there will be concurrency process that will take place. It is laid out by statute <coughs> in combination with a provision of more detailed and robust information that is going to be provided in this traffic study to try and parse out how much option A or option B will potentially tax the traffic infrastructure that's currently out there. How much and what can be done will obviously be parsed out in that future phase, and then how much of that due to option A or option B, uh, and what this developer can do to offset those potential externalities will be parsed out again at that future phase. But to get back to your question, mm. we cannot hold the developer responsible exactly. for an already constrained infrastructure if it's not being contributed by the proposed development. Okay, and, and to kind of dovetail and um, my, an, an additional question. <coughs> um, I know in the past that uh, I've worked in uh, municipalities where I've heard the term uh, proportionate share. Does Manatee County have proportionate share or is there another mechanism for the project to pay their pr proportion of impact to a, a network? So when, you, when you use the term proportionate share, that's, that's a, you know, I think it's from the law, from, right. from the, the case law. Mm -hmm. And so there isn't like a Manatee County proportionate yeah, share. Right. Or, I mean, I'm sure maybe on, on a technical aspect, I think the counties will have certain yes. technical mm -hmm. yeah. um, the, rules. But in terms of what proportionate share means, uh, yeah. isn't something that will. Uh, I, I think um, some municipalities have adopted like uh, mobility fees, in, like pay you, you just pay a fee. But um, typically, a proportionate share, if it's my under, if my understanding is correct you measure the impact and you do the percentage of the um, project's impact and that's the proportion. So I guess you're talking about the different processes uh, uh, well, that, my to help question accomplish is, transportation Does currency? Manatee still, uh, I, I, don't, I, I don't recall, I apologize, I probably should know, we don't have mobility fees. There is no mobility fee. Okay, There's and no so the... It's, it's proportionate. Okay. Yeah. okay, okay, all right. That's just so I understand how, how money's end up in the in the uh, <coughs> budgets you know for improvements so, right okay. so I guess you'll have different methodologies that are kind of uh, contemplated by statute to uh, accomplish transportation concurrency and okay. I think you mentioned one of those yeah. tools in the toolbox okay all right thank you no that's 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 very helpful thank you for the explanation thank you all right uh, anything additional for staff want to talk about traffic some more yeah. <laughs> we could talk about traffic. That's what we're going to get a solution. So, all right, very good. Um, let's go ahead and go to staff. Uh, I'm sorry, not staff. Um, uh, applicants rebuttal. Closing comments and rebuttal. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, for the record, I'm Scott Rudisell, Blaylock Walters. Uh, have been sworn. I'm here on behalf of the applicant. Unfortunately, I am going to touch on traffic a little bit since it got really sideways up here uh, for a while. Um, so I do want to bring it back to that and then uh, let uh, Christy follow up on, on some of the planning stuff. So just, just so we're all on the same page, and I know I appreciate you trying to bring it back uh, to the concurrency discussion. So the county has adopted concurrency, and that is a process where um, projects are reviewed to ensure that they meet an adopted level of service standard at the time that the project comes forward, right? When we are not seeking concurrency at this time for this project, it's, it's too early in the process. So at this point, all we're looking at is 
you know, based on those background trips and the other projects that are out there and the, you know, the uh, improvements that are planned, do we think there is capacity for this project when it comes forward? And the answer that you heard from both of the transportation experts on this was, yes, we do. We think there is. Um, so when they talk about those, those background trips and who's going to be responsible for the improvements, I want to touch back to the, you know, we talked about proportionate fair share. And so the way that will work is the projects that are responsible for those trips will be responsible for their proportionate share of the improvements that will be required down the road to ensure that facilities are in place to meet that adopted level of service standard. <coughs> now, the other thing I want to point out is, you know, there was some, there were some comments about, oh my God, it's a D, it's a level of service D where we're almost, you know, it's terrible. D is the county's adopted level of service standard. So when you're reviewing these projects, you know, D is the standard that, that ultimately um, must be met. So it's not something that, it's not something that's a, that's a bad condition. Um, <clears throat> I think that's all I have. I'm going to turn it over to Christy. <coughs> if there are any questions from the commission? Thank you. Thank you. Do we want to refute D? <laughs> Christy Brewer with Height Design. I just had one final comment. Um, we touched on the development in the area of this project and talked about the international trade port to the south of us with their 2.5 million square feet of non residential thought was that this project would be additional housing options for some of the workers in that area. We also believe that when 49th Avenue is constructed, um, it will be, it, it will connect these two projects. There is a small segment uh, between the southern boundary of this project and the northern boundary of the International Trade Port that has not gone through the rezoning process. Um, but we are working with staff to try to figure out the alignment from our southern boundary to, again, their northern boundary to complete that segment of roadway. So we do think that that will help this project and the surrounding projects in the future. Thank you. Carol Clark with Medallion Home, and I have been sworn. Just um, one thought, and God bless me, I am going to mention transportation. Um, we actually think that this project may help solve transportation in the area. When you look at north-south um, uh, trips, you've got Ellington Gallette and you've got 60th. We have a new arterial that is going to bisect this property and is going to make a connection from 301 and back up and loop around to Ellington Gallette. So this will offer additional means uh, for folks to go north-south. And um, we think that is very, very important. And we will have an obligation to construct that road through our project to the, to the southernmost most entrance. But we have had discussions with the county to look and see what we can do to accelerate completion of that road because we all think it's uh, very, very important um, to the area. So we, we just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close the uh, public hearing and open it up for discussion, deliberation, uh, debate, um, uh, and then just a little bit of business. We're, we're going to break for lunch and then uh, come back and finish the agenda. So I, I think we could power through, but I, I need to uh, make sure that staff is uh, well, well nourished to continue. So, <laughs> so all right, just just a couple of thoughts. Um, I don't think anybody's uh, trying to represent that that roadway network is not problematic. I, I just, just to be perfectly clear, I've sat at that four-way stop sign, so it, 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 we all know that. The reality in Florida is that um, with development, one of the things that comes along are impact fees that tend to fix problems. That's why in Florida, it, I think uh, it's um, a common trend to see the impact and then the solution. For whatever reason, the system we have doesn't plan well for building roadway networks in advance. So um, the, the um, information I was trying to get with regard to um, the concurrency, uh, what I wanted to make sure is that we don't put the county in a position where if it's uh, if this decision is based on 
the traffic that it, it's something that can then be um, uh, overturned and it, it pretty much takes it out of the, the decision maker's hands. It goes to the circuit court. So uh, we need to make, make sure we work within the framework of the rules that we have. So uh, those are just a couple of thoughts and some of the questions I had were specifically <coughs> intended to make sure that I understood what we can do and how we can do it with regard to this. Again, traffic is a problem there, but I think with the development might come the solution. It, it's gonna, I, I would hope, provide a, a benefit, but it, it doesn't exist there today for sure. And if, it, if this project weren't constructed, um, there are other projects in the pipeline that are gonna provide additional monies into the, the hopper, but it, 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 I, I think um, the, the ability to build a roadway network like 49th or 51st, um, it, it's, it just provides different routes to go. That's, we need more of that, more north-south, east-west connections in, in the county, so. That, those uh, are just Chair. some of the thoughts. Oh, Mr. Rutledge. <laughs> God, is that you? Hey, Mr. Chair, I, just, I, I have to point out that to say that adding several hundred homes as a solution to a traffic problem, uh, it's difficult to envision that, if mm -hmm. I can just say that. I'm not disagreeing that some development does develop interaction, but taking a traffic situation that's really desperate and saying adding 500 homes helps it. Uh, it's interesting. I'll have to think about it some more. Well, uh, my point isn't that the homes provide the solution. It's the, um, I don't know how much it is, $10,000 per home, the $5 million that would come with those, <laughs> that each of those homes would pay into it. That I, I think as it is, one of the reasons I believe that roadway network might be deficient is that the county's budget doesn't allow improvements in areas like that. So again, that's why we have impact fees is to allow development to um, offset or, or provide corrections to their, their impacts. Yeah. Uh, understood. I just, it, it is a kind of a curious statement when you say it on its face, that's all. Yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate the clarification, but again, I'm not trying to say that roadway network does not have problems now. Understand. It obviously does, and it needs to be fixed. I don't know if this project uh, were denied and did not go forward. I don't know that that would facilitate any improvements in that area. Understood. Yep. So, any any other thoughts? Okay. All right. <coughs> For Mr. Rutledge, um, and it's not related to this case, but. I think you need some some additional green and gold in your background, or maybe something along the uh, the bull variety. Thank you. My, my USF uh, diploma is hanging at the opposite end of the office. Let the record reflect. He's got his USF diploma. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, so if there's no additional deliberation, me. God bless you. Uh, we're gonna uh, consider a motion, Mr. Chair. I'll make a motion. Mr. Ron. Based on the staff report, evidence presented, comments made at the public hearing, and find the request to be consistent with the Manatee County Comprehensive Plan, the Manatee County Land Development Code, as conditioned herein, I would recommend adoption of Manatee County zone, Zoning Ordinance Number PD MU 1805 ZG, approval of the General Development Plan with stipulations A1 through A10, B1 through A4, C1 through C5, adoption of finding for specific approval and granting specific approval for alternatives to the the Land Development Code sections 14015B4 to eliminate the requirement to have a main entrance of the building facing the street. Number two, 4027D7 to reduce the requirement, to reduce the required front yard setback from 25 feet to 23 feet for a single family detached unit with the front loaded garages. And number three, uh, 10053 to reduce the requirement of Reduce the requirement of uh, parking spaces for multifamily dwellings from two spaces per dwelling to 1.8 spaces per dwelling, including guest parking. I'll second that. Oh, I have a motion and a second by Ms. Kibi. Keba. Keba. Oh, I get it wrong every time. It's stuck in my head that way. 
Uh, very good. We have a motion and a second. Any additional discussion? All right. Uh, I'd just like to say this. I think that the, the difficulty for me on this vote is that, um, you know, I don't think we on the panel at this point have any vehicle to address the concern that we see in front of us, which is this traffic issue. Uh, I think the location of the development is appropriate when you see the <laughs> stuff going on around it. And I do think the traffic issues are an ongoing concern at every vote that we take. And so my frustration a little bit is I'm not opposed to the zoning location. I'm not, I'm, I'm supportive of their rights to develop it, but I feel very conflicted in saying, yes, they can do that and know what the impact of the roads will be. And, and, and accepting it, you're hundred percent right, Mr. Chair, which even you might question where you're hundred percent right, but it's, it's a concern that we don't have a solution or a recommendation or a vehicle to impute that concern in the approval process. So, no, I, and I, I appreciate that. And I, I fully uh, acknowledge I could be wrong, but I, I would also um, remind us that we have a framework that we have to operate in. Uh, it would be nice if we could uh, dictate from, from the dais, but we don't have the ability to do that. And um, with that, I'll go ahead and call the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Like sign? Aye. Mr. DeLesline. And uh, chair votes aye. And Mr. DeLesline, just for the record. Just timing of the project and traffic issues. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Very good. And again, uh, with that, the, uh, the application is advanced to the board with a, a favor, uh, an approval. And again, uh, we appreciate the dialogue. This is how the system is supposed to work. It, it's good to, to vet these things. Uh, I think a group is gonna make a better dis decision than an individual. So thank you for, for that dialogue. Ms. Ms. Wenzel. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, if the board would not object, if you wanna push through and take item number five, we have a staff member that has prior obligations for the afternoon from utilities that might need to be here for any questions. Okay. Um, I would I would ask uh, uh, the clerk's office. Or do we need a break or? I mean, you take a real quick one. Yes, ma'am. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna power on, okay. and we'll take a uh, five minute break. Uh, we'll be back. Let's just say we'll be back at twelve ten. All right, great. Very Thank good. You. Thank you.
ahead and uh, reconvene the the hearing, the the meeting. So we're down to item number one. Is it? Is that where we are? Number one. Number five. <laughs> we started at the front of the. Are we back to traffic? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> item number five. Uh, who's presenting item number five? Can we get it read into the record? I got caught in mouth. I can't read right now. Item number five, small scale amendment by county initiated plan amendment. This is PA-21-07, ordinance 22-11, future development area boundary map amendment, um, amending a Manatee County ordinance number 89-01 as amended, the Manatee County comprehensive plan, providing for purpose and intent, providing findings, providing for a map amendment of the Manatee County Comprehensive Plan to maintain internal consistency by updating the land use concept map and element two, future land use amendment, updating the potable water, wastewater service area map, element nine, public facilities. Uh, this is legislative and your case manager is Charles Andrews. Mr. Chair, can we yes. make sure Mr. Rutledge is Mr. Rutledge? Yes, I am here, Commissioner. <laughs> Thank you. Good Very good. Thank you. All right. Mr. Andrews, good afternoon. Good afternoon again. Hi, Charles Andrews, Senior Planner, Building and Development Services, and I have been sworn. Uh, let me pull up the presentation here. Thank you, Natalie. Okay, so before you, this is for uh, it's a future development area boundary or FDAB mapping inconsistency. Uh, PA 2107, Ordinance 2211. Uh, this request is for a small-scale county-initiated map amendment to maintain internal consistency with the FDAB by updating uh, the first document as a land use concept, Map N under Element 2 of the future land use uh, element, and the potable, number two, and the potable water wastewater service area map, Element 9, public facilities. Uh, here is the current land use concept map, Map N, the FDAB boundary there, and the current potable water wastewater service area map. Uh, some background, uh, the FDAB was created with the adoption of the 1989 comprehensive plan. The intent of the boundary was to develop west to east, west of the FDAB line, while retaining agriculture and rural, do rural residential development east of the FDAB line. Uh, furthermore, the boundary is intended to serve as a means to provide an efficient use of land and public and private investment and to contain urban sprawl. This line, this line shall be consistent with the boundaries of the water supply and wastewater service areas established by the Board of County Commissioners. An overview, uh, the area here, you'll see that there's a graphic here. We got a circle with an arrow kind of getting a little closer in here on the area of uh, discussion. Uh, the area constitutes a mapping inconsistency totaling 32 acres. This inconsistency was discovered during the review of two pending applications submitted to the county for SR 64 North property. That's PLN 2103-0021 and PLN 2103-0022. Uh, first off here, the amendment site comprise, the amendment sites are comprised of two areas which are generally located north of State Road 64 East, south of Waterline Road, and west of Dam Road. The first area is located west of the FDAB line and is comprised of the Ag Rural, Agriculture Rural Future Land Use category on one and a half acres. The second area is located east of the FDAB line and is comprised of the Res 1, Residential 1, and MUCR, Mixed Use Community Residential, future land use categories on 30.5 acres. Uh, the history here, as outlined in the subsequent slides, the area has been amended over the years, resulting in an overall increase in residential density with no change to provide coterminous boundaries to the FDAB line and the utility service area boundaries. Uh, following up with that history, uh, we have Ordinance 0561. This is a county-initiated plan amendment which changed the site from Ag Rural to the Res 1 future land use category, thus placing additional acreage classified as urban residential east of the FDAB. Uh, ideally, the utility services map should have been updated with this amendment. However, an amendment to the map was never processed. Uh, Ordinance 0912 or PA 0906, this is a private initiated plan amendment which changed the site from Res 1 to the MUCR, uh, resulting in a density increase on property located east of the FDAB. Uh, the approved change resulted in a 66 dwelling unit increase on property located east of the FDAB. Uh, the Res 1 there, they have the calculation there with MUCR for that breakdown. 
uh, utility service map was still not updated to address this amendment. Uh, <coughs> lastly, we have ordinance 10-30, PA-10-23. This added definition for the FDAB to the definitions element of the comprehensive plan. It amended the FDAB line for the potable water wastewater service area for property located Six, SR 62 east of 301 and west of, of Corbett John Road. However, this was not the subject property in question. Uh, like I was saying, the site, this is a proposed realignment of the FDAB line, which will result in a boundary which will provide a coterminous boundaries to the FDAB line and the utility service area boundaries. There's two graphics here on the slide. On the left is the existing FDAB, and to the right is the proposed FDAB, and that follows parcel boundaries there and cleans those, those two areas up in question. Uh, this is the new land use concept map. I know at this elevation, it's kind of hard to, to see where we're, we're at there, but it's right off of 64, like I was saying, uh, right in there. And then the potable water, wastewater service area, that's the updated map, and that's what that would look like. Positive aspects, the request addresses a mapping inconsistency with the FDAB, which will provide coterminous boundaries to the FDAB line and the utility service area boundaries. Uh, the, internal in, the internal consistency among the various maps, such as the land use concept map, map N, potable water, wastewater service area, <coughs> is maintained per Florida statute 163.3187, section 4. Another positive aspect, per discussion with the Utility Service Department, staff is in agreement that the overall proposed realignment of the FDAB line represents de minimis impacts to utility services and is in support of the request. Uh, negative aspects, it moves the FDAB line further to the east. Mitigating factors, the area, is proposed, the area of proposed change is very small, i.e. 32 acres, with the density previously approved. Any pending site plans for the area would require Board of County Commissioner approval. A conclusion, the request appears to meet the applicable policies of the Mandy County Comprehensive Plan and Land Development Code regulations. Uh, the request is for transmittal of Plan Amendment PA 21-07, Ordinance 22-11. Uh, one thing to note here before I wrap up is we have John Goodwin with the Utilities Department. Should you have any questions? And I'm here if you have any questions. Very good. Thank you. Um, any questions for staff? Question. Yes, sir. Ralph. You said how many acres to the east? How many acres to the east? You're going to extend the line. Right. It's how many acres oops, to the east? Back. Thir it's 30 and a half. And what is that linear in, in miles? Oh, in, in miles? Oh. Oh, okay. Um, it's 0 .007. Well, <laughs> it, it's, well I, I want to give you a response here. Um, right. I don't have a ruler, but I need to get to scale. All right, never mind. It, it's never not mind. to scale. It, it's, very, it, it's less than a mile. It's not, yeah. Okay. <coughs> Other than getting everything in alignment, what is the advantage to the extension of the boundary? is that it's currently been approved with the ordinances that I had shown you through the history, um, approving those, essentially approving that density in those areas. So it's just providing that cleanup that would identify that this is still, this is within the FDAB and then identify ag rural land, that little one and a half acre piece on the other side. Okay, my next question is, sure. will it allow additional um, building, which would not have been allowed before, because we've extended the FDAB to the east. And it's, what's the? In other words, if it's rural out there now, right. is this mm -hmm. gonna make it single family possible? It, well, uh, let, let me ask the sure. question okay. a different way. I'll change Thank your zoning. Um, the, these pro there were, the, the properties that are associated with this move, they yes, were sir. previously zoned where they added density, correct? Correct. Well, the future it land use was, was changed. Was changed. To, future to land use was yes. changed. It, proposing just the line never, that it, it would allow density. It was more of a cleanup. It's already yeah. it's already permitted. It's just the line. It's it, a formality, or I, maybe I'm misspeaking here, but it's... And, the and then also the, the, serv the utility service area, which is oftentimes uh, one of the subjects associated with the FDAB. That's kind of the limits of services for the county. Correct. That was already granted. What we're Correct. doing here is kind of backwards identifying it yeah, it, it was never cleaned up back in 05 yeah so we we had a uh, a jog in the line instead of a yeah a, a jag <laughs> versus, yeah a zig versus zag right should have happened right or <coughs> have a 
So if the sewer, the sewer, uh, whatever it's called, mm -hmm. is on Dam Road, for example, this is not going to allow the sewer line um, to be extended beyond Dam Road. Oh, no, sir. That, well, that's it, correct. I, I think well, the more uh, pertinent thing is Dam Road's outside of the urban service boundary, outside of the utility service areas, so uh, there should be no, sir, no, no sewer there. Because yeah, water line becomes Dam Road as it goes. Well, I can't as it as it goes down. Yeah. But that part of Dam Road is <clears throat> is outside of the FDAB. That road. makes sense. Okay. Oh. okay. Uh, I have a question. Sure. Um, the, does the FDAB generally follow property boundaries? Generally speaking, yes, sir. Okay seems like it would make sense to to do that you'd hate for somebody to flip their property yeah yeah so, and um i guess the, kind of the other part of that question is um i well i, I think i know that if the applicant or the um owner of these parcels already uh modified the comprehensive plan of course they're going to agree to this this action so i generally speaking the county coordinates when properties are moved in or out of boundaries that generally and, true and that's correct and this is like i was saying in the, the other slide here in the presentation is that this came up as as these two applications here for sr64 property north came in and we were looking at that and we, we found that that you know zig where it should have zagged kind of situation there so this is just more of a cleanup to address just the inconsistency that happened back in 05 when it should have been adjusted. Okay, all right, that, that's all I have. Okay. Anything further for staff? Thank you. Very good. Anything needed for the record? Uh, motion. So. <laughs> oh. oh, come on. Oh, I, uh, hold on. Um, is there anybody in the audience who would like to come forward and make a comment <laughs> related to this application? <coughs> Ms. Good Labar. afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. I'm Katie Labar with Stantec. I represent Neal Communities of Southwest Florida, and I, I am representing the two applications that Charlie mentioned um, for State Road 64. And so when you asked if anyone associated with the property, our clients are contract purchasers for that property, and we have been working directly with staff on this pending um, request because, as, as he stated correctly, this issue did arise as we were going through the review process for those other pending applications. And so um, we are in full support of the staff report that staff has presented, the facts that they've given to you, and we ask for your recommendation of approval. Thank you. Great. Very good. Thank you. All right. <coughs> Is there anybody else who wishes to come forward? Anyone at all? Somebody's in. We have someone on the line. Okay. All right. Oh, uh, this is, and for the record, this is legislative, not ju uh, quasi-judicial, so we have the uh, folks who can call in. So if you could, please state your name and that you have been, well, you, uh, never mind, just state your name. <laughs> Caller 069, please state your name for the record. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Mark Van Der Rie, and I'm representing the Waterline Road Preservation Group. Um, I'd like to make a few comments about this, uh, property. Uh, one is I, it really wasn't, uh, the, the moving of this FDAB re, uh, locating wasn't really properly, um, communicated with neighbors in the area. So, uh, being a public hearing, I think a better job could be done there and should be done. I think this should be postponed until more public input was, uh, could be made also. I don't think this is an error. I don't think this is a mapping error. Uh, I've been around this area back there for over 20 years. And um, back in 89, I think this was intentional. The, the, the location of the FDAB line was intentional. This property buffers right up against the state park uh, property, uh, which is uh, a piece still to the west of Dam Road. Uh, the property drains into the uh, Lake Manatee watershed, and I believe that this was never intended to be dug up and uh, with piping put in there uh, for water and sewer. I think it was always intended to be a buffer. 
a 32 acre error on mapping just doesn't make any sense to me. I think there is something else at play here. And I would like for the county to dig into it a little deeper, get a hold of the people from 05 and find out why this was, uh, they could, would consider it to be a mapping error when uh, it, I think it was uh, done intentionally. Now, uh, commissioners, uh, the county commissioners, uh, Ma, uh, has stated back in April that she would never uh, be in favor of developing east of the FDAB line. And here you're trying to move the FDAB line so you can develop east of it. Uh, Commissioner Cruz has said back in April when other FDAB issues came up, he wants to see a comprehensive approach to developing with regards to the FDAB. He did not want to do it piecemeal, uh, which is what we're doing here and uh, some other uh, activities with FDAB uh, uh, relocations or building east of the FDAB uh, would fall into that category. You're piecemealing it. That's not the right approach. I agree with Commissioner Cruz. Commissioner Servia uh, has stated on several occasions that the one public uh, meeting that was held regarding FDAB in general was not enough. There needed to be more than one uh, meeting to discuss this large issue that affects the East County. And I, I would behoove the planning commission to uh, respect the wishes of those three county commissioners and postpone the moving of this FDAB line until you can get more information and dig into it uh, a, a whole lot deeper than you have. And I believe you will find that this buffer was intentional. If you bring in state park people, uh, talk to the state about it. I think you will find that you will not want your, this area dug up. Yeah, your, uh, your, and your time is laid in high density. I'm, put in. Thank you. Your your time's up. Thank you for the comments. Thank you. Is there anybody else on the calling in? No one else. Okay. Thank you. All right. We're going to close the public comment portion of the hearing, and uh, for uh, the commissioners, any. Any questions, any additional information necessary? Well, I, I do want to make a comment because I think I was the only one that really voted against a big development that was on the other side of this F dot uh, line. And I agree with the caller to the extent that I don't believe we want to be moving the line so that we can develop more without uh, some analytics. But I do think also that as you get into these developments, there are certain times when the appropriate drawing of a map that was done 10, 15, 20, or 30 years ago doesn't imply that it was correct then. And I think our knowledge is better and so forth. So I'm inclined to follow the, the staff recommendation on this. Right. And also one point of clarification, the the previous discussion about doing stuff uh, east of the FDAB was a privately initiated action. This is an action generated by the county. So. Again, with regard to consideration that it, it's being done nefariously, I think it doesn't have a lot of merit because it's a cleanup. There were other rights that were granted through other processes. This is just um, something that was, <coughs> was discovered um, as you know applications were being processed. So that, that's and what I would I add one final thing. I think to the extent that. Uh, the caller's representation about the commissioners, uh, the good thing is they're going to make this decision ultimately because they are the only voting power that has merit and standing. And so if all of them agree with his comments, which I, I have no reason to disagree or agree, uh, it's ultimately within their control to make the decisions about where the development stops. And, uh, I, you know, that yeah. that's not in front of us. And I, I don't think it's for us to make a call what the commissioners do or don't think. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, in this instance, the commissioners have the right to vote yay or nay. Uh, it's not up to us to presume what they're going to do. We're being asked to to uh, investigate and analyze this, and that's what we're doing. So, All right. With that, uh, any closing comments from staff? Hi, good afternoon. Charles Andrews with staff again. Uh, just a few items here. Um, so this item was heard at Planning Task Force uh, a couple months back, and I, I, I believe that Mr. Vandery was in attendance for that. Uh, this is also advertised on our website. Um, and I've, I've talked to the caller several times regarding not just this item, but uh, SR64 North, just those two applications we've got, because I'm also the case planner for those. 
Um, and then regards to Ordinance 0561 and Ordinance 0912, like you said, it's privately initiated, but this is back in 05. Mm -hmm. And like we said, this wasn't, you know, part of something else. It was just something, you know, the land use change in the property. And we just never updated the map for whatever reason. So it's just kind of a clean up and something that came to light, you know, after reviewing these two uh, pending applications. Um, and also when we talked with the state, they didn't have any concerns. So when we reached out directly to them, I've got correspondence on that. They they don't have a, a problem with this request because it's county initiated, so. Okay, when you say the state, you're referring to I'm sorry, to the, the, um, the, the, the state park, sorry. The or Department of Environmental Protection. Right, the, correct. Well, the, the, the who manage the park. Right, the, the, the folks that own the property just north, or just, excuse me, to the east, which is the rec open space, the, uh, yeah, the, the park, I, I forgot the official name of it, okay, but, the, but yeah. The, but the, <laughs> the folks the, that do the, the park parks for the state. The park people. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. All right. Okay, thank you yeah, very much, it. thank you. All right, uh, with that, we're gonna close the, <coughs> close the public hearing and chair will consider a motion. I'll make a motion. Yes, ma'am. Um, based upon the staff report, evidence presented, comments made at the public hearing and finding the request to be consistent with the Manatee County Comprehensive Plan, I move to recommend approval of the transmittal of plan amendment PA 2107, ordinance 2211. We have a motion, is there a second? I'll second. Mr. Ron, second. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Mr. Rutley. Aye. Okay, thank you. Uh, opposed like sign. Chair votes aye. Motion passes 7-0. All right. Uh, do we go ahead and just knock out the last one? Okay, thank you. <coughs> Ms. Barrett, if you could, please read uh, item number five, is it? Or six? Six into the record. And after you read it in, don't drop the mic, please. Not that dramatic. Item number six. <coughs> LDCT 21-05, ordinance 22-01, county initiated <coughs> land development code text amendment, home occupation, home based business. Amending the Land Development Code by amending Chapter 2, Definitions, Section 200, Definitions, Chapter 3, Review, Authority, and Procedures, Section 316.12, Alterations to Approve Special Permits, and Section 324.2, Approval Authority, Chapter 5, Standards for Accessory and Specific Uses and Structures, Section 511.7, Home Occupations. This is legislative, and uh, presenting is Planning Manager Lisa Wenzel. Thank you. Good afternoon. Lisa Wenzel with Comprehensive Planning, Building, and Development Services. This is a legislative item, county-initiated land development code text amendment regarding home occupations and also known as um, home-based businesses. And I'd like to go to the slide presentation. Um, so that if we could go to the next slide. Um, so, so the summary and background, um, within the 2021 legislation um, session, House Bill 40, 403 was passed, which preempts areas of local government regulation of home-based businesses to the state. The bill prohibits local governments, including Manatee County, from enacting or enforcing any ordinance, regulation, policy, or taking any actions to license or otherwise regulate a home-based business in violation of the bill. Manatee County's Land Development Code currently regulates home-based businesses or home occupations, of which several sections are inconsistent with the new bill. So the proposed amendments before you are to ensure consistency with that bill. House Bill 403 states that local governments cannot limit the types of home occupations. Home occupations may operate in an area zone for residential use and may not be prohibited, restricted, regulated, or licensed in a manner that is different from other businesses in a local government's jurisdiction, except as otherwise provided and spelled out in the statute. So the next few slides, I'm going to go through um, the areas of home-based businesses that the county may regulate. As viewed from the street, the residential property must be consistent with the uses of the residential area surrounding the property. 
the external modifications must conform to the residential character and the architectural aesthetics of the neighborhood. The operator owner may not conduct retail transactions at a structure other than the residential dwelling. However, incidental businesses, business uses and activities may be conducted at the residential property. Business employees who work at the residential dwelling must also reside in the dwelling, except up to two employees or independent contractors who do not reside there may work at the business. Activities of the business must be secondary to the property's use as a residential dwelling. Um, for parking, Manatee County may regulate um, some of the parking requirements. The parking must comply with the local zoning requirements. The use may not generate a need for parking greater in volume than a similar residence where no business is conducted. The local government can regulate parking, but cannot regulate um, the traffic that is generated from the use. Local government re may regulate the use of vehicles or trailers operated or parked at the business or on a street right away, provided that such regulation is not more stringent than those um, for a residence where no business is conducted. The vehicles must be parked in a legal parking space <coughs> that are not located in within the right of way or over a sidewalk or on any unimproved surface of the residence. So it has to be a legal parking space. Um, the county may regulate parking or storage of heavy equipment at the business which is visible from the street or the neighborhood, neighboring property. And the heavy equipment is defined as commercial, industrial, or agricultural vehicles, equipment, or machinery. And finally, the use must comply with any relevant local or state regulations concerning signage, um, equipment or processes that create noise, vibration, heat, smoke, dust, glare, fumes or noxious odors, and any regulations concerning the use, storage, or disposal of hazardous materials. And the regulations may not be more stringent than those that apply to a residence where no business is conducted. Um, so with that, the amendments that are included in your packet are consistent with the statute and 559.995 um, for home-based businesses. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Very good. Thank you. Any questions for staff? No, sir. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, we'll open up for public comment. Is there anybody in the audience who wishes to come forward? Okay, seeing no one come forward. Are there any callers? No callers. All right, we're going to close public comment. And uh, do you wish to <coughs> provide any closing comments? Thank you. All right. Uh, with that, we'll close the public hearing, and the chair will entertain a motion. Mr. Chair. Mr. DeLesline. I move to recommend adoption of Mandy County Ordinance 2201 LDCT 2105, amending the Mandy County Land Development Code. Thank you. We have a motion. Is there a second? A second. Second, Mr. Smock. Uh, any discussion? All right. The chair's going to call the matter to vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Chair votes aye. Motion passes 7 0. And I believe that concludes our agenda. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, call the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you.